Good deal. I will call this meeting of the Pearland Independent School District Board of Trustees to order on June 23rd at 5.01 p.m. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in the Board of Texas. Meeting. Charles, I'm here. All right, good deal, Mr. Bakken. All right, let the record show that uh, all trustees are in, in attendance. Gooden, Decker, Carbone, Barry, Murphy, Floyd, and Bakken. All right, thank you for signing in there, Mr. Bakken. All right, uh, we will do uh, public comment now. And I have 10 speakers who are signed up uh, to, to address the board. And I'll go in the order that they were, they were given. But if anybody's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just go ahead and just jump in and see uh, who, 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 who we have here. All right, um, Ms. Galton, Arcana Singh Galton. You can use your, if you signed up and if you're on, uh, go ahead and hit your participants tab and raise your hand or your uh, reactions tab and raise your hand. Kim, is it possible she's one of the phone numbers that is not uh, physically or not on video? It's pop, yeah, but I, yes, it's possible. She would have heard me uh, right. call her name. Let's see. Okay, so, uh, okay, Ms. Galton, we'll go to Ms. Katayo, Coquila Katayo. Okay. Uh, phone numbers for you. Yeah. Lena Bassett. Swat Ben, I'm this sorry. I, I am admitting a few more people as you're okay. calling, just FYI. Okay. okay. Yeah, I see him coming in. Uh, Swati Verma. Cynthia Goparaj. Jennifer Buchanan. Um, I'm here. Ms. Can Buchanan? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I certainly can. Okay, thank you very okay. much for joining us. Um, give me just a second to get a timer squared away and you will have uh, three minutes in which to address the board. And you may start when ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, hello. I have three kids in Pearland ISD and our family's been in the district for 12 years. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you for being school board volunteers. I'm a volunteer in the schools myself and I know sometimes it can be thankless. And I also know your volunteering helps preserve our kids' most valuable right, their right to a safe and equal educational opportunity. I know our district has a history of prioritizing safe schools. After the Santa Fe High School tragedy where 10 died, our district proactively fortified schools to feel safer. I would imagine that if parents knew for certain there would be a school shooting at their school sometime next year, no one would go. And yet, even with the most conservative estimates, School without adequate safety precautions for COVID-19 will kill more than 10 students and staff next year, worse than a school shooting. Please continue prioritizing safety when you consider what school will look like in August, as case counts for COVID-19 are fast rising among school-age students and their families. I hear some parents feel entitled to send their maskless children to school every day, especially with the governor's announcement that schools will be open in the fall. The current CDC guidelines for schools state that being closer than six feet apart and not wearing masks creates a high risk environment for contracting COVID-19. Sending children to school without strict mask enforcement and without reduced class sizes will not be safe. Additionally, opening schools only to those willing to risk their health and the health of others is unfair and it's wrong. I know you got complaints about online schooling in the spring, both parents and students felt online learning was not the same as in-person learning. But to only provide in-person learning to those who put themselves in a high-risk situation is not an equal educational opportunity. And if that means opening the school on a rotating basis to all and requiring all to homeschool some of the time, that would be better than only allowing full educational access to some. The district is in a position where no matter what is done in the fall, some will be mad. Please begin by requiring all faculty and staff to wear masks in the distance while they are representing the district. And when considering what schools will look like in the fall, please prioritize safety and fairness. Because as you know, no matter what you do, 
someone will be mad. Please let them be mad because they had to distance and wear a mask because you provided a safe environment for everyone because faculty and staff were good role models. Let them be mad because Pearland ISD did the right things to keep our community safe. Because honestly, that would be so much better than having them be mad because their child was denied an equal and safe education or having them be mad because their child died of school acquired COVID-19. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Buchanan. Okay, next on the list is Rahul Sharma. And again, if you're on the meeting and you have uh, signed up for a spot in public comment, please go ahead and under your reactions tab, if you're on a computer, just go ahead and raise your hand. Let's see. Benabrata Sin. Okay, Dr. Murphy. All right, and uh, Lena DeChicho. No, okay, let me start off with, with the beginning of the list again. Uh, Archana Singh Gautam. Coquila Katyal. Lena Bassin. Swati Verma. Cynthia Goparaj. Okay, and then we got back to Ms. Buchanan. Okay. All right. Um, just in case there was uh, some confusion on what time the public comment would be, um, when we come back out from the... Hello? Yes, hello. Sorry, ap apologies. I actually hung up rather than <laughs> unmuting myself. This is Dr. Murphy. Oh, yes, ma'am. All right, go ahead. You, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so, as you know, um, I'm, I'm a physician scientist and a parent in a district, and since about 2017, when I first showed up before the school board, I've offered many times to help the district help students and families with specific vulnerabilities where the district had not offered dedicated outreach. I have organized several other physician mothers in the district, including a psychiatrist, two black physician women, and a higher education physician administrator to contribute to everything from meeting the needs of economically disadvantaged and special needs students to tackling student mental health, racial injustices, and a toxic culture of competition, and a lack of civic responsibility that is killing our community. Never have these problems been more acute than once they have become compounded by COVID-19. I can only imagine that it is without the appropriate guidance from medical professionals that um, we have seen that students and families have been exposed to unmasked teachers when picking up band instruments, returning books, etc. And why PISC social media sets no example on the importance of masking and social distancing in the post-COVID era. I've also heard corroborating accounts from far too many parents and students that this is true. And that's beyond my own uh, experience. It's clear that the district continues to not, uh, not to have a commitment to transparency, accountability, or a true inc truly inclusive process to manage escalating challenges. It's not about the outcome, it's about the process, and that is where leadership fails. Committees that are hand-selected to exclude experienced, educated voices of critical dissent are indefensible. Peter Block, an American visionary in organizational development and civic engagement, said this about accountability and commitment. The essential insight is that people will be accountable and committed to what they have a hand in creating. All you need to do this, all you need to ensure is to uh, make sure that people in the room are a diverse and textured sample of the larger world that you want to affect. What Pearland ISD says when it does not include certain groups in that conversation is that it does not care about those groups. I'm, dif I'm, I'm deeply concerned that the district makes plans for school in the fall uh, without including the plan in the planning, the parents, the children with special needs, the households with medically vulnerable people, the children who have no devices or internet, the families who cannot afford supplemental tutoring for all of the gaps that are left by Pearland ISD, from failures to fully engage our tech and educational resources among our parents even prior to this pandemic. How do we ensure that we meet the needs of as many people and among the most vulnerable in this district and not make decisions based on committees of the most privileged by including them in the deliberative process of how to manage the new normal? So I really encourage the school board to reach out beyond um, those that you normally reach out to, uh, to participate in committees so that you truly have a representative 
sample of our community to understand the breadth of the issues that we face so that we can meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Okay, I'll ask uh, one more time if there's anyone who signed up for a public comment who is, is here and not, and not spoken yet. And I was saying uh, right before Dr. Murphy uh, began that we will go through this list one more time prior to once we come out of exec session and just to make sure that there were no scheduling snafus and um, we'll, um, we'll get that straight then. See you. All right, at this point, the Board of Trustees of Pearland Independent School District will now convene into a closed meeting to discuss the following items posted on our agenda this evening, uh, allowed by Title V, Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. And those are listed on the agenda. Uh, no voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in the open meeting. And as I noted, we'll go back through the uh, public speaker list one more time and then we will take the COVID-19 update right after we uh, reconvene and do any motions that come from a closed session. All right, it is now uh, 5, 12 p.m. and the board will uh, move into its executive session. Okay, the board will reconvene in open session at 6, 19 p.m. No action was taken in closed session. Let the record show that all trustees are uh, now present in the open session. Is there a uh, motion? I move we accept and approve the superintendent's recommendation for employment of personnel as presented. Second. Motion Decker, second Carbone. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Trustee Carbone, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Murphy? Aye. Gooden votes aye. Floyd. Mr. Floyd? Aye. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Good deal. Sorry. I got you now. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Botkin? Aye. Mr. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Decker? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, Mr. President? Uh, yes, sir. One of the people uh, hired tonight uh, in a new role is the new assistant principal for Turner High School, and I believe she is on this call. Her name is Angela Piedras. So just uh, congratulating her on this. Yes. Congratulations, Ms. Piedras. Are you, are you here? Would you like to congratulations. have the floor? All right, congrats. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Good deal. Okay. All right. With that done, uh, we will have our introductory remarks by Trustee Murphy. Well, I'll just keep it brief since I don't have a public meeting to uh, stand up and, and talk in front of. But um, I really just wanted to take a second um, and thank um, everyone that's on this Zoom call uh, and, and our administration. I think that you guys have done a terrific job with all the constant changes that are going on and that we're facing. Um, I know this going into my fifth year on the board, I don't think we've ever faced anything like this, even including a, a hurricane. Um, at least that we know how to prepare for the beginning, the middle and the end of a hurricane. This has no end. So I applaud all of you that have done all the work and are continuing to do the constant work as changes come out. And, Obviously, the one job that we all do is dealing with kids and their parents, and it can't be easy having to hear from um, all the different sides of parents and things that are going on when you're trying to make the right decision um, about how to take care of people and, and keep people healthy. So again, I, I just want to thank you guys for the wonderful job that you guys continue to do um, to make the best decisions for our district. And I know you guys are working hard day and night to just make everything you can uh, going forward uh, as safe as possible. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Trustee Murphy. Appreciate that. All right. As noted, we will go back to pick up to see if any of our public comment speakers uh, joined us late. I'm going to go through the names that I have and um, sound off uh, when you hear your name. And you'll have three minutes to speak to address the board. Uh, Gautam. Katya. Basin. 
Verma. Gold Porridge. Sharma. Sin. And uh, Desichio. Hi, how are you? <laughs> hey, I'm good. How are you? Did I pronounce your last name wrong? Always, but that's okay. Everybody does. <laughs> good deal, good deal. Okay, let me get a timer for you, and then we will hand you the floor. And you may begin when ready. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for working with me and coming back to public comment since I couldn't figure it out the first time. But I had something written out and I changed it up just a little bit just based off of the last two speakers I heard speaking prior to executive session. I wanted to say I'm very proud of our district. I have two kids in the district. I grew up here and um, I commend you on doing a great job trying to get a, our kids back to school. Um, I want to refute what one of the speakers say, uh, said. She said that leadership is not, has not been very transparent. And I could, I don't agree with that. It, down from Crystal Carbone, who's constantly on Facebook, interacting with us as parents, um, or engaging with us via private message, if we send her a message, or even with you, uh, Mr. President, and, or any of the other board members, I thank y'all for being very transparent and giving us information when you get it, when it's appropriate. Times are changing day to day. So we can't, I, I don't even as a parent expect y'all to put everything out with, without the unknown or without knowing what's coming down the pipeline. So I, I would like to refute that statement. Also, as, an, as a parent, um, I know that we work a lot and we can't always participate on committees and there y'all get people that typically can, but I'm, I'm, I have the opportunity and I am currently working with on a committee uh, for the first time. And I would like to say that it's been eye opening, eye opening that parents, we need to have open minds when working with the administration instead of, um, just constantly coming at y'all um, with either the media whenever we don't like something or bringing them to the board meetings, uh, bring the media to the board meetings um, just to, to get attention. I'd like to say I, as working on this committee with you guys, um, with the district, it's been very eye-opening in what you have to do in order to prepare our kids for this upcoming school year. And unlike the previous speaker said, y'all are ensuring that all of our kids will have technology at their fingertips in order to learn. You're ensuring that our, our kids with special needs are gonna have what they need in order to, to get the education that they deserve. And also when it comes to transportation, I mean, y'all are trying to coordinate between Pearland High School, all the middle schools, all the junior highs, the GTA, I mean, it is a lot, and it's been, it's been, wow, overwhelming to see what the district is going through to try to coordinate all of this. I'm currently working on the um, back Five to school seconds. committee. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and I just want to say that I commend y'all. I thank you, and I feel confident that our children will be safe when they go back to school this year, and thank you for all that y'all do. Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate it. All right, that was, uh, that will complete public comment. And as noted previously, we will take the COVID-19 update and uh, do that now. So Dr. Kelly, the floor is yours. All right, yes, sir. Um, in some ways I feel like um, I'm sort of drinking through a fire hose because uh, we just had a very, very important meeting with the uh, commissioner via Zoom uh, just to show you the importance of that meeting, um, 1,000 superintendents were supposed to be participating. 3,000 total people signed up and exceeded their capacity to even uh, hold the meeting. So they had to wait until a few people got off. But anyway, uh, what he spoke about, he follows up from the governor last week. The governor essentially said last week that he sees us heading towards a return to some sort of new normal where everybody goes to school. 
uh, every day. And he says that in addition to that, the second thing that he saw was that there are parents who do not want to put their kids in the school because of uh, anxiety or fears about the COVID-19 and that school districts should be prepared to offer distance learning to them. Well, those that's two of the three options that we have been working and continue to work on and plan for this summer. Uh, total distance learning and total kids at school. And the third option is what we call the hybrid where kids would be face to face with teachers part of the time and learning distance learning uh, part of the time. That part was very unclear today from the commissioner. In fact, on the Q&A document, it seemed to be saying that if you have a hybrid option like that, that you must allow any parent who requested to be at school every day. And, and the difficulty with that, of course, is that the whole reason for the hybrid is to cut down on the number of uh, kids that are in the school at one time. So the hybrid option, we're continuing to work on it, but it's not clear uh, under what conditions that would be allowed. So uh, the commissioner began his remarks today by saying he could not address health concerns because it's a very fluid situation and changing from week to week. I was uh, reading an article uh, or an interview with uh, the governor today uh, in, uh, he was interviewing with College Station Bryan people and apparently they've had a spike there and he was basically telling everybody you should wear a mask and stay indoors. So that's a different message than, than the direction we felt like we were getting last week. So it is very fluid. Nevertheless, we need to prepare for all three uh, possibilities, uh, or at least full distance learning and uh, full participation at school and possibly both of those happening at the same time. Um, today in his remarks, he talked about synchronous versus asynchronous learning regarding distance learning, meaning that in synchronous learning, you might be a teacher and uh, the camera's focused on you like this Zoom meeting and you are delivering instruction live to a bunch of kids via distance learning. And the teachers would be taking attendance like they would normally and, and so on. Then he talked about asynchronous learning and that's where kind of like we went through for, for the most part in the spring where you were um, finishing assignments or doing things uh, on your own time scale. But now, different than the spring, and this is a good development, if there's going to be asynchronous learning, there's going to be tough measures in place to make sure that kids are participating, that they are getting normal grading procedures and other things. So um, we are, you know, because this information is like, what, three hours old right now, uh, I don't want to go too far until I've analyzed it. But on the TA website, he has um, placed a PowerPoint and some Q&A documents that we are now going to uh, work our way through. But essentially what he is saying there, along with the governor is, yes, you can receive full funding for distance learning uh, for those kids who stay at home, provided that you meet these minimum standards for that uh, distance learning. So that was the big uh, topic of the day, you might say. Um, let me see if I can, uh, uh, go on here to other stuff, uh, some more local type stuff. Um, as uh, someone mentioned here, uh, our last speaker, Lena, um, our, our uh, back to school committee on which she sits is made up of uh, about 35 people right now. It has administrators, teachers, parents, daycare providers, athletic director, fine arts director, principals, nurse, a physician, the county engineer, college reps, and a couple of other miscellaneous type positions. Um, and we're working through lots of issues, as you can imagine. Um, one of the conclusions based on the last two hours is that um, we know that options one and two, which are total distance learning, what we do with, for that, and total being at school, those two options will be in play and we need to be ready for them. Um, unless the health situation changes uh, over the next two months. Um, we uh, are 
We've had about 40 people weigh in so far on a parent survey that Kim Hocott has been working on. And Kim has been assembling questions from other districts, as well as what people here want to know. So we're close to finalizing that. I think uh, Kim said she was going to finalize that by tomorrow. And so that will go out by the end of this month at the latest. And uh, will be sort of a point in time, how are parents feeling about a whole bunch of different uh, issues related to uh, return to school. That will be followed once we get that information back. We also need to do a teacher staff survey and kind of find out where they're at because a lot of these options require options among teachers. Um, we need, and then a third, I don't, know, I don't know if I'd call it a survey, but a third thing we'll be doing is the HR department needs to find out who is immunologically, uh, uh, what's the word, immunologically compromised uh, or has other health conditions or other things that we need to be aware of and how those fit with the job description that they might have for the coming year, and whether it can be uh, changed to accommodate those things. Uh, tonight, and uh, I'll save my thunder on this, but uh, a very important set of decisions is about technology uh, because what we're proposing is that there be as, as close a good connection between what happens uh, when kids are at school with the teacher and with technology and what happens at home when they uh, are trying to learn or complete assignments and so on through distance learning. Um, right now, uh, we're, uh, the, the issue of masks is being uh, widely discussed among people uh, everywhere. And uh, right now, if we were to make a decision for the coming school year, it would be that all employees and all students wear masks. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I don't want to go too far because the situation is fluid. And so I don't know what will be happening over the next uh, almost two months before we begin on August the 19th. I would like to say about masks, those will be the responsibility of the parent and the child. And we will have tons of extra masks ready, but we want to make sure that parents uh, send their kids to school with those masks on, um, rather than waiting until school and waiting for a school mask. Um, now, some of uh, these decisions will become clear over the course of the summer. Uh, even all the superintendents in Region 4, we're, we're meeting together all the time to try to figure out how to make our way through these rules and regulations and laws and so on. Um, but uh, one of the bellwethers or harbingers of what may happen is what we're seeing unfolding in athletics and UIL and fine arts. Already, they are opening the door slightly and allowing some limited forms of strength and conditioning and drills provided that social distancing is in place and other uh, precautions are there. So uh, we'll be interested to see how that develops because right now, if you, if you talk to the UIL people uh, or you get their, their information, they're talking about returning to uh, regular football season and stands with, uh, with, with parents and kids in them. So uh, given that, um, will that remain? And that affects for us not only UIL, but we would likely place the same restrictions, if there are any, uh, on all of our clubs and activities, not just those that are UIL, those things which meet after school, but aren't necessarily connected to uh, athletics or fine arts. Um, one thing, and I, I guess I've probably said this in the videos, but I, I want to repeat it here, and that is, in many ways, bus capacity is the tail that wags the dog. Because right now, though our buses are capable of carrying as many as 73 kids, if social distancing is in place, proper social distancing, the whole six foot rule, you move all the way down to 12 to 18 kids per bus. So if you don't get busing right, and you don't do that well, then the whole infection problem is over before the kid even gets to school because we've got half of our student population on buses. So those are some of the things that we're also working through um, and, and need more guidance on. And it would be helpful to get guidance from the state. It, it seems like the state is basically saying the parents need to take responsibility for uh, certain things before the kid gets on the bus or before he arrives at school. And that's about as much 
uh, guidance is we're getting if we go to full participation for, uh, for that particular school uh, or that di school district with everybody going to school except those parents who want to keep their kids at home. Um, one of the things I want to say about the hybrid situation, I already described it, it seems to be complicated now by what was released today, but one of the things that our transportation director pointed out, which I didn't really think about, is you can't create the hybrid situation overnight. In other words, even if we're ready and we have all our plans in place, if there's a COVID outbreak on a Tuesday, we're not going to be ready to completely change all busing patterns and all routes by the next morning. So it could very possibly be that we are closing a campus for three days or something until we know what we can and can't do, whether it's hybrid or total uh, distance learning or whatever. Um, just uh, for, for, for the general population, it isn't just a matter of what the governor and the commissioner says. It's not just a matter of what Brazoria County is going through uh, or the Houston area. A COVID outbreak in, in a particular school of just one kid in a class affects other kids in that class and could affect that entire class or that entire school. And so we've got to be ready to address those situations. It isn't just a matter of a district-wide pronouncement or even in some cases a campus-wide. If we have to make decisions like those, then obviously we need to have robust, comprehensive distance learning in place for those days in which kids cannot be at school. So that's the whole point is in the spring, it was more like do the best you can in terms of delivering instruction, getting assignments, grades, et cetera. It was very low in terms of, um, you know, we expected you to turn in the work, but we weren't gonna, you, Grades weren't going to be worse than before and, and all this. That will not be the case in the fall. If when distance learning is in place, uh, grading and all those assignments and all those kind of things must be robust, comprehensive, similar to what we would do uh, in a pre-COVID uh, phase so that kids really learn, are really accountable, and we are accountable for their learning. The commissioner has made it very strong that star testing and all that will be in place in spring 2021. So um, we need to be ready for that. Um, right now, it's a little uncertain about uh, quarantining rules. Right now, the rule appears to be uh, from TEA, six feet, uh, it, uh, you, would, you would think that someone would need to be quarantined if they were within six feet of an infected person for 15 minutes or Number two, they were directly coughed on or, or received um, cough droplets. So uh, I don't know if that will change, but that's what we will, that's what we must uh, deal with and plan on for now. Um, so uh, one superintendent said this from San Antonio and I, I I liked his word. He said, we got to be nimble. We've got to be ready to move to different scenarios depending on what may happen. And so we continue to plan. We continue to develop these three options so that we're ready for any of the three or a combination of the three. Um, and as someone said earlier, um, uh, I, I do commend Texas in this one way. They, they are providing a massive number of masks, gloves, thermometers, and hand sanitizers to every district in the state, and so I do appreciate that. Um, I guess that's where I'm at now, Mr. President. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that uh, that needs to be addressed at this point. Members, I'll uh, ask if any of you have any questions. All right, Dr. Kelly, one of the things I guess I'll go back and emphasize is that the state has said that uh, there will be a distance learning option Yes. Well, parents yes. do not want to put their kids in school and the state will provide funding for that. So that's that's one of the backstops that I think folks are really concerned about. Like, are you going to make me send my kid to school? And the answer is no, we can't. We're not. And you also mentioned that, um, you know, if we were firing up today or tomorrow, then, yes, we'd be everybody masked up and um, social distancing and so forth and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. 
it's a moving process. Uh, you know, it's there's a lot to still be determined, but uh, we we appreciate that update. Members, I'll ask again if anyone has any uh, yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah, Charles, I do. Uh, it's Lance yes, Potton. Um, you know, with that distance learning um, going on, there is they came out today, um, which uh, they're, I guess they're going to be going through it. The, the, Dr. Kelly made mention earlier he's going to be going through all the guidelines and everything, but there will be held accountable. Students will be held accountable to a stricter um, guidelines, if you will, um, if they're staying home than they were uh, in the spring, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Is that correct, Dr. Kelly? Yes, sir. And uh, in order to receive funding, what basically the commissioner is saying today is you've got to follow these steps and make sure these things are in place in order to get credit for that distance learning. So it's a lot stricter than it was in the spring where all you did was you attested to TEA that yes, you were doing distance learning. That's all you had to do. Now you've got to keep grades and you've got to show student progress and you've got to do other things. You've got to uh, make sure that they're working at least half a day per day. You can't have situations where a kid says, I'm just going to work on Friday. Uh, Monday through Thursday, I'm considering myself off and I'm going to do all my work on Friday. And what the commissioner says, nope, you would get credit for Friday. He expects everyday accountability, attendance, and grading and assignments. So Dr. Kelly, speaking to that a little bit more, um, the attendance piece, we do we have to meet a certain threshold or percentage of attendance in order to receive funding from the state? Well, uh, basically, uh, the number of kids you have in school every day drives the funding. And what he did say today, which is very nice, he called it a grace, grace period, is that, for example, he expects all districts across the state to have lower attendance in the first part of the year. And so he's saying he's going to give a grace period where I think it's the first two six-week periods, the first 12 weeks of school. Your ADA funding, if it's 1% lower or greater than 1% lower than it was at the same time last year, that they'll just uh, push that figure out of the way and use your ADA attendance for the rest of the year so that you get a better average. Okay. So that's as much as I know right now, uh, just reading through what, what the commissioner said today. So that gives us some leeway of if children have a fever and not knowing what the source is or not knowing if they've been exposed, that there's definitely a push towards safety for students and teachers to err on the side of caution until they know what the diagnosis yeah. is. Or yeah, I mean, this, and the state is pretty strict about that. If you have any symptoms or anything like that, you are to stay home. Now, you know, I will say this about distance learning. It's not exactly what you asked about, Crystal, but um, when we uh, provide this distance learning option for the parents and the kids, I do want to avoid the other extreme, which is somebody saying, I'm gonna stay home all day and take all my subjects, but I'm showing up for football practice at three. That cannot happen. If, if you're staying home because of COVID, then you can't turn around and say, well, I'm gonna show up for extra cricketer. We're gonna to have to have some boundaries in place mm -hmm. on, on that kind of thing. And was there any reference to um, students with special needs or um, behavioral concerns and all of those kinds of things in the call today? Well, not in the call today. Now, Dr. Nixon has showed me some things. Um, and, you know, our plan was, uh, or, or the direction we were going with was that uh, kids that are life skills students or who are severe emotional problems or other things that, that are better served by full day every day, no matter what we were doing with everybody else, that we would accommodate that. You know, whether the school was half shut down or not. Uh, this weird thing that Dr. Nixon told me about is, is that some sort of regulation says that you can't do more for the kid who's special needs than you can for a regular kid at this point. So we've got to work our way through that uh, scenario. I see Dr. Nixon raising, or nodding her head. I don't know if you want to say anything there, Dr. Nixon. I think it's just that we can't require. So luckily with our special education students, we have the ARD committee meetings. And so those do allow us to individualize to meet the needs of each student. So there will continue to be those opportunities available um, if the parent chooses to 
allow their student to be on the campus in perpetuity that we would accommodate those as long as their safety parameters are in place. Mm -hmm. and, and based on student need, yes. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions from the board? Dr. Kelly, let's, let's close out just kind of by talking about the, um, the, the schedule and the meetings that you have uh, scheduled and the uh, the surveys that you're planning on doing just to give everybody a, a feel of uh, what to expect down the line. Well, uh, we we meet as uh, the, this return to school committee I mentioned earlier meets uh, pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, every once in a while, it's two weeks, but uh, that will continue to go on all through the summer. Um, we're going to release the parent survey no later than the end of this month. And then shortly, we need to get back that parent survey to understand better what parents are thinking before we ask some of the questions that would impact teachers and staff. So the next survey thereafter would be the teachers and staff. And at some point, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we also need to do more of a um, health screening with our own people to determine who is uh, vulnerable. Uh, you know, just to give you an example, um, school bus drivers, a lot of them are retired. Us, uh, older employees. So we need to be able to understand what, what our drivers can and can't do. If that's where you're going, uh, Charles? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that was President Gooden, if I could ask one more question. I asked sure. the question about the uh, attendance for students, but um, Dr. Kelly, can you give any clarification for attendance for staff, faculty and staff and teachers? Yeah, now there will be some flexibility as we, we've had as much as, uh, flexibility as we could during the spring and, and into the summer right now. Uh, the way that things are laying out so far in the fall is that the federal government has essentially said that employees who are uh, test positive for COVID-19 are entitled to two weeks of uh, paid leave. Um, beyond those two weeks, uh, remains somewhat of a dilemma because there are, for example, situations where uh, it is not necessarily the employee who has the COVID, but who is being quarantined because someone that they were close to had it. How do we handle that situation in terms of leave? And what do we do for the employee that after uh, they've been quarantined for a couple of weeks, uh, then has further leave needs attached to COVID? Um, I may be bringing back some ideas on, on how we can help employees to the board. Uh, you may remember that the board uh, wanted to do something in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey uh, to, to help with that situation. And so we may be doing some of the same here again. Okay. Uh, and I'll, uh, I, I kind of went through a little bit of uh, TEA's document uh, and uh, one of the things that I noticed that they had not developed any uh, guidelines on how long you shut a school if you have a positive, um, you know, how many positives shut down a school, how long do you keep it shut down? Uh, are you expecting any guidance from them on that? Or is that something we're going to lean on our local experts to uh, develop our own policy or the region for superintendents? So will it be a collaborative? Mm -hmm. type of Hard for me to, uh, predict, but I would, I, would, I would edge towards those will remain somewhat local decisions based on infection rates or other variables that we, the district, would take into account. That would be my, my guess, Charles. Okay. 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 I, I just kind of want to reiterate what I, what I mentioned earlier and emphasize what Dr. Kelly's been mentioning very, I think, intentionally is this situation so fluid that this is just really a, a, a where we are right now. And in, in two weeks, we could be having an, an entirely different conversation. Um, so I, I know it's very frustrating. I know everyone wants concrete answers, um, and it's frustrating for us, especially you know seeing the, I think the quick change of the governor and, and, and the commissioner. And um, so I, you know, in two weeks, in a month, uh, maybe in six weeks, I think we'll know a lot more, uh, and then we can make more concrete decisions. So I would just put that out there. Yeah. Well, well stated, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Lots of moving pieces. Lots of moving pieces. Okay. If uh, no more of the uh, members have any questions, all right, we'll uh, we'll we'll close uh, that piece of uh, the COVID update. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. 
You're welcome. The, uh, the work that you and your committee are doing. Uh, let's see. We will go move on now to uh, the consent agenda. The consent agenda is presented as items one through nine. Are there any items that a trustee would like to pull for full discussion? All right, ask a second time, any items to be pulled? Hearing none, is there a motion? Board President, I move that the Board of Trustees accept and approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. Is there a second? Second. Second Carbone. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Trustee Murphy? Yes, aye. Good and votes aye. Trustee Floyd? Aye. Trustee Bakken? Aye. Trustee Barry? Aye. Trustee Decker? Aye. Trustee Carbone? Aye. Item carries 7 0. Thank you very much. We'll move to the regular agenda. Item 1. On the agenda is a designate, a delegate, and an alternate to the 2020 TASB Delegate Assembly. Uh, Dr. Kelly, would you lead us through that? I know that's a- uh, Yes, Mr. President. Question, Bill, but uh, just... You know, every year we, we, we designate a, a, a delegate, a primary delegate, an alternate, and they essentially spend some of their time at the TASB convention voting on various resolutions and things that uh, TASB wants to have a united voice on. Uh, the only uh, difficulty for this year, as your secretary Bobby will tell you, is that it's uncertain whether that conference will take place. Uh, I don't have the dates in front of me. I don't know if that's in your packet, but um, right okay. now they are planning as though it will take place. So, okay. All right. And so we have here in the uh, 2019, we had uh, Trustee Bakken, our master trustee, one of our master trustees. And Trustee Barry was the alternate. Was, um, gentlemen, are you all comfortable with serving again, or would you like to rotate? Um, I'm good with serving. Okay. Mr. Barry? I'd like to be considered if that's an opportunity. Oh, I'll sure. No I'll nominate Crystal for alternate. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Thank you, Mr. Barry. <laughs> good deal. So we have uh, Mr. Bakken as our delegate and Mr. I mean, excuse me, Mrs. Carbone as our alternate. Is there a motion? I believe that was Trustee Decker. Second. Second. That second was Trustee Barry. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we're going to vote. We're going to, uh, let's see, Trustee Bakken. Aye. Barry. Aye. Decker. Hi. You got, you got that? I got it. <laughs> okay. Aye. Murphy. Aye. Wooden votes aye. Trustee Floyd. Aye. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Item two uh, consider Board of Trustees appointment to the Paralyzed ISD Education Foundation Board. Uh, as you know, currently, uh, Trustee Barry is serving on that board. And uh, he indicated that he'd like to see that position uh, rotate. Uh, the, um, the, the role and the responsibilities are there in the agenda packet. Uh, is there anyone who would like to uh, step up and take that position? All right, I, I wanted to give y'all a chance. And so I didn't want to jump out there in front. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, nominate myself <laughs> if that's okay. Is anybody, everybody all right with that? I'll second that. All right, good deal. <laughs> All right. Is Thank there, you, Charles. Uh, yes, sir. Thank Paralyzed you, Charles. Education Foundation. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Is there a formal motion? So moved. Make a motion. Second. Go ahead, Crystal. Go ahead, Crystal. All right. That was uh, Carbone on the motion. Is there? I, let me have another second. Second. Second, Barry. All right. Um, we'll vote through. Uh, Trustee Barry? Aye. Decker? Aye. Carbone. Aye. Murphy. Aye. Gooden votes aye. Floyd. Aye. Bakken. Aye. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. That vote carries seven zero. All right. 
Item three, consideration to approve the 2020-2021 budget and a discussion of the pros and cons for the tax rate election. I'll let the, uh, the public know that this is the third time that the board has seen the budget. There were two previous uh, workshops where we worked through some of the discussions here. And uh, Dr. Kelly, should I, I pass the floor to our CFO? Well, let um, me just uh, say one thing up front, Mr. President. Um, okay. I was a little bit, wasn't sure how to arrange the order of this because the next issue, uh, the technology laptops is related. But I thought, you know, maybe it's better to look at the whole budget first and then decide on the technology uh, addition or not thereafter. So uh, with, with that uh, beginning step, uh, Mr. President, to turn it over to George Annie. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Carter, let me note that we could, we could take a look at uh, the budget and then we could uh, just postpone it just to later tonight, go and pick up the, uh, the one to one student device initiative, figure out where we're going to land on that price and then come back to the budget and sort of understand what that total impact is going to be. But we can be flexible. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Carter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Sure. So as you mentioned, we've met twice already uh, prior to this and we held our public hearing on June 9th. So I didn't prepare uh, a full presentation as nothing really has changed uh, on what we are proposing um, as far as the budget is concerned other than, of course, a discussion regarding technology. So um, are there any questions? Uh, Georgiani, there's one thing I wanted to add. Remember, you and I talked about today. The board in past years yes. has wanted to have that flexibility, and we did not put a statement in here to this effect, that you retain the ability at mid-year to decide whether you want to do supplemental pay of any kind. Uh, the the difficulty there is that if you do not say that in advance of the contract year, you cannot legally do it. So if you want that statement in there that basically something along the lines of move that the board uh, consider in, in late fall 2020, uh, a mid-year supplement to employee pay based on a projected fund balance or words to that effect. I just wanted to make you aware that that is there and that in the past you've kind of wished that we had at least inserted it. Okay, Dr. Kelly, you said that it was there or it was not there? It is not, we did not, I, I'm, I should have made that as a possible second motion for you. Okay, okay, uh, okay. But uh, a, a trustee could make that, that motion. Yes, yes, okay. yes, sir. Well, I, I have a question just about um, whether we're gonna proceed. I, I, I totally agree with going to get the tech first, but uh, well, talking about tech and then coming back to this. But I guess um, the discussion needs to be about the, the fifth golden penny. Right, is that what we're talking yes. about tonight? Penny and potentially a, a, a Vader election or um, you know, a TRE, right? Correct, so that's, in, that's included in the agenda item uh, to discuss if you are interested. Um, the budget does include that fifth golden penny which requires unanimous board approval um, once we get our certified values, of course, in August. Um, but also to engage in a conversation regarding do you want to have um, consider a tax ratification election to possibly go for the full um, additional four golden pennies are out there? Okay. Okay. And yeah. Okay. So, but for for the fifth golden penny here on this budget, that's in the proposed tax rate, and that just requires a unanimous vote of the board. Okay. When we're talking not today, ma'am. Not in August. That is. I'm, I'm it sorry. is not required today. Okay. okay, in August. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is there any any question on on the budget? It's it's there in the packet. We see what the um, uh, total budget is, the total fund balance, and uh, so forth. So, are there any is there any uh, desire to go back and open any of that up? No, nothing's changed that I see, right, Ms. Carter? Nothing. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then let's go ahead and move into the discussion on the, on the tax rate. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, the discussion on the tax rate uh, election. And the, the state legislature renamed them from TREs to VATREs, yeah, which, yeah. you know, you kind of pronounce Vader like, you know, Darth Vader. 
<laughs> it smells real bad. But anyway, so there's there's a uh, a possibility of a VATRE, and uh, you know, Dr. Kelly, I'll I'll hand that to you. And uh, just board, just note that I'm I, I am noting that we have not taken a vote on the budget. Hey, hey, Charles. Yes, sir. Charles, is there any way that we could potentially go to the the IT discussion first because that really weighs heavily on what our ultimate uh, budget's going to be, whether either one golden penny, five golden pennies, okay, um, long term. Just just a thought. If no one else wants to do it, I'm fine with that too. I don't have a problem with that. Is there any uh, any uh, objection? Okay, and we'll kind of suspend the rules here, and we'll just um, is everybody's in agreement that we'll postpone uh, item three. We'll come back and pick it up, and then we'll go down to uh, item four on the discussion and approval to purchase iPads and laptop student devices uh, for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, yes, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, the number one deficit that I think that we would all uh, agree on for the spring distance learning was um, the inconsistency and the inability for uh, parents and kids to necessarily fully participate in the educational offerings of the district, either because of lack of technology or because the technology they had was for one, one uh, family member and there was three kids or uh, they didn't know how to use uh, the schools. Some of that is a software issue and we've, we've been working on narrowing that down to, to much easier two software platforms rather than five or six. But the, the best answer to make sure that there's a seamless transition between the technology that we use at school and the software and everything else would be to have that child, every child in our district, have a device, uh, the same device at home. And as we've uh, researched this over the last uh, couple of months, um, we see as uh, that in grades uh, pre-K through one, that would be, we would recommend uh, if we go down this road, an iPad, and that for grades two through 12, a, a more of a um, Windows-based tablet. Uh, we have a, an outstanding offer from uh, Dell and also a, good, a very good offer from, uh, from Apple. And essentially, and I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Georgiani, uh, if we're really gonna push out as many as 21, 22,000 devices, then um, we're looking at various options, uh, leasing versus purchasing or lease purchase. Um, and so Georgiani has done a lot of work on this and has come up with a proposal which I think merits your, your uh, consideration. Uh, you wanna take it from there, uh, Georgiani? Sure. So the first thing that we had to determine was what type of devices the students need. And as you're aware, uh, administration decided on, on the pre-K through first grade having iPads. There are two options that we have out there, a 32 gigabyte and a 128 gigabyte, which is essentially $100 um, extra um, per unit. Um, we've been discussing it and it seems like the 128 gigabyte is the uh, route to take uh, because of memory issues and uh, the work that the students are going to be having to save um, into the devices. And so we have negotiated with I Apple very aggressively and they've come back and uh, given us a pricing along with uh, kind of like a bundle with a, with a, co uh, a, a keyboard case, a, ru a rugged keyboard case, um, as well as uh, Apple Care Plus, which is a special for schools so that if a device gets broken, we're able to replace it free of charge. Um, there's a limit on, on how many times uh, a single device can be replaced, but um, there's that uh, opportunity there. And as, as well as the JAM uh, school license, and that allows basically a, our technology department to push out the software and to push out um, updates um, automatically without having to get every single device uh, from the students. And so that cost um, in, in total is a uh, million six hundred fifty four four hundred sixty three for approximately um, oops, I had the number there, three thousand one hundred units. We still we, we are still determining the total number of units. It's likely going to be a little bit less than three thousand one hundred. 
uh, and they're offering us a four-year lease at 0% interest. So basically just breaking the cost uh, down into four payments, uh, which makes it a lot more feasible. These devices have an expected life of more than four, uh, more than four years. At the end of the lease, we own them. We don't have to return them back. They're ours um, to keep. And so that is uh, um, that's the, the part on the, on the iPads. For grades two through 12, we're proposing uh, Dell Latitude 3310 um, laptops. And including in that, we're um, adding the endpoint detection and response license, which basically protects us from cyber threats and the enterprise management server, which enables technology to manage all the devices and track the devices, um, what size they, they visit, et cetera, uh, filter the, the, the content they can download um, uh, centrally. We quoted approximately 20,360 devices. Again, this is a maximum number of units. We don't think we're gonna need that many. It's likely gonna be a little bit less than that. So uh, we also negotiated the pricing down pretty aggressively uh, to a $440 uh, per unit. Um, typically, this costs us approximately, I wanna say, around $600, uh, maybe Greg can, can give me the, the right amount. But so for 440, it's, it's a very good price. The total for that is 8,958,400. That's just for the devices alone. They are offering uh, what they have for our type of um, entity. It's a tax exempt lease purchase. And basically they allow us to finance um, this purchase through Dell Financial Services. Um, there is a, a, an, an interest rate associated with that. And the annual payments for the devices is roughly $2.4 million per year. At the end of the lease, the devices are ours as well. We don't have to return them. Um, we can choose both with, with Apple as well as with, the, with, uh, as well as with Dell to, um, they have resale value to, sell them or to keep them. In the case of, of the laptops, the plan is to keep them and to use them for testing purposes. Um, there is a, as well a five-year subscription to that coordinate for, for what I dis discussed regarding the cyber, uh, protecting us from cyber threats and uh, from centralizing the management of, of, of the devices. And that cost, uh, they have a five-year subscription or a or a one-year subscription. So it's about $1.4 million uh, for a five-year subscription, which they break into annual payments of 284,000. So that's to add on to that. Um, of course, adding 20,000 plus devices will require additional personnel um, to manage those devices when they break, uh, we need to fix something. So, um, we're estimating to initially need about two uh, te technicians. Um, that's to start with, and depending on how the program continues, then we will determine if we need more or, or what, what else we need to do. We're also discussing, aside from the staff, you know, the guidelines that we're gonna have to have in place and the agreements that we're gonna have in place need to have in place for when we actually distribute those devices um, such as you know what their responsibility basically for making sure that they protect the devices um, that they don't lose them um, that they that they treat them as if they had bought them themselves basically and then what fees uh, are going to be associated whether they're whether we're gonna um, not charge fees, uh, as an example, for students that are economically disadvantaged. Um, is it an annual fee? Is it something that we can allow them to purchase? Um, so we're thinking of everything and the legalities behind it. Um, so because of the time frame for when we actually need the devices um, at the beginning of the school year, we would like to be able to uh, 
do anything that we need in regards to purchasing and then you know, the delivery, the time it takes for the devices to get here. And uh, of course, to set them up, uh, technology also needs time to set up all the devices. Uh, we are asking for your approval to move forward with the plan as we're requesting it and to delegate the, purchase, the purchasing authority to, um, to Dr. Kelly. Um, that's all I have. Greg, do you want to add something? I think you pretty much covered most of it, Georgiani. <clears throat> um, I, I think we've, what we're faced with here is whether or not the district can actually afford to do this. That's what the board is considering. Um, I think we've got some uh, very aggressive pricing from, from Dell Computers and from Fortinet. Um, it, 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 it just is what it is. Uh, to Dr. Kelly's point, when it comes to the personnel, we're basically building the airplane as we try to fly it. But that's what we do, and uh, we'll do everything we can in technology to make it a success if that's the direction the district chooses to go in. Yeah, let me add to that, uh, board members, that I use the term we're a little bit late to the party. Um, other districts that have had better funding over the last few years are already there with one-to-one -one, uh, initiatives in place. Um, and I have never thought before that we should take that step that we couldn't afford it. But I would say now with the distance learning, not only a possibility, but a mandate that at least some uh, students will be in that boat, that the best way to accomplish that is uh, making sure that every kid has the device that we uh, are overseeing, sending out the software to, uh, and it's basically the same type of unit that we have on campuses so that we don't expect as much, we don't need as much help from parents or understanding from kids because they're, they're very similar to the instruments that will be available on campus uh, and at home. So we're moving fast on this, but we think, you know, in, in view of the COVID crisis, we ought to take this step. If we if we go down this road that um, we're we're suggesting here to get back to Jeff's uh, bigger point, you know we're adding about 3.1 million dollars to the uh, budget uh, beyond your previous item that we just talked about the, the budget. We would be adding 3.1. Where would that come from? It would come from fund balance, and we would be paying that 3.1 million not only this coming year, but for the succeeding three years thereafter. And um, under this particular scenario. Hey, but John, I would also like to add that that would be indefinitely, right? Well, uh, after, to go to one to one. Yeah, I mean, after the four years, uh, it's kind of hard to look out beyond that in terms of technology. But um, yeah, I mean, we would be basically converting uh, a lot of our operations to technology instruments for the kids and moving away from uh, the remaining use of paper textbooks in, in, in many cases. Um, I got a couple of questions, couple sure. quick questions that you probably have an answer to real quick. Um, as far as uh, I see a lot of information here regarding uh, devices for the students. Yes, I know we've spent a lot of money recently on teacher devices. Uh, do we need to uh, somehow, what about teachers that are doing off-campus teaching in the event that they're not in the classroom? Yeah, that, that would uh, uh, devolve onto the tablets we've purchased for teachers. And Greg, you want to kind of give an idea of where we're at in the distribution of all those and, and all of that? Right, and, and you're, you're correct, Jeff. Uh, every teacher was given a, uh, a pretty powerful uh, tablet. The tablet has the same resources as their desktop computers. The uh, the big all-in-ones that we, we gave them because you never know where they're at, what they're doing, and how they're, they're performing their work. Um, there are some, some challenges working on a tablet. Uh, some folks have chosen to attach a, like a, a computer screen uh, so that they have a bigger monitor to look at, uh, and that's something we could look at doing. Uh, we have not been tasked to look at that. The demand has not been high and was not high during the, the time that we, we were at. The real focus has not been on the teacher side of things as much as it's been trying to focus on the students. Uh, I, I would like to add to your point, uh, you're right. The, the comment that, that I've told George Annie um, in this discussion, you're basically, you're accepting a car payment for the foreseeable future. Uh, and, and that has always been a concern 
because of our budgetary uh, situation in the district. But at this point, uh, to Dr. Kelly's point and to what we're hearing from the commissioner, we're just kind of being forced into this with the remote learning. So, so yeah. let me. Are there any bond funds available to offset any of those immediate costs? And uh, do we know of any grants available that could possibly be available to offset any of those costs? I, I am not aware of any grants. Uh, I know we do have a grant that pays for our hotspots, uh, and we are currently working with T-Mobile to renew that grant for the next couple of years. Um, uh, as far as um, bond money, uh, we, we have a couple of projects that we need to finish up to see where we're at on that. That's something we certainly could consider as we get closer to September, October on completing those final projects that were in the in the bond proposal back when we were presenting to the steering committee. Um, I, I have to believe that there will be funds. Uh, we do have money in our regular budget of about $200,000 annually that if we do this, it kind of alleviates some of the need to replace or replenish equipment on campus because most of that is fairly new. Um, again, we, we will find a way to get it done. I don't typically come and ask you guys for additional money. I think George Annie and Dr. Kelly would tell you that we find a way to make it happen, but the biggest concern would be if teachers wanted something larger to work from home, especially if we have some that are basically those remote learning teachers. There may be a small cadre of them that need to be uh, set up more with an, a, an office space at home, and, and we do have some of the all-in-ones already here that we could certainly repurpose for that. Uh, also, I'd like to add, uh, Jeff, I'd like to add, uh, Crystal asked a similar question at last meeting about use of the bond funds. The very last page of your packet uh, here today, setting aside the technology and what's left there, um, right now we uh, anticipated a bare minimum $3.3 million left over from all the projects completed from the 2016 bond election. So those could be used for this purpose. Um, and I might be jumping ahead here a little bit, but linking back to, to Jeff's original question is, let's look at this before we talk about the TRE. Uh, and, and Georgiani, make sure I don't oversimplify this, but if the amount of one penny for a TRE increase is about 2.6 million, then that compares to this, you could compare that, I suppose, to this 3.1 million that we're saying would be an annual cost for uh, this initiative. All right, and that's kind of what I was leaving to. Uh, my concern was that, you know, if we're, if we're gonna have, or potentially have this, this, this long-term expense, because, you know, we don't wanna run into the same problem we ran into. Uh, it looks like we're kind of going down that path again, but running into the same problem, re refreshing 100% of all devices, all network, all network equipment across the across the district. That's a pretty sizable amount. That's and that, that would be totaled uh, in excess of thirty million dollars, uh, include bond money plus whatever the potential cost of this is, the the, the all in one cost associated versus the four year amortized cost. Um, you know, so we pretty much washed that one penny, and that was my that was my thinking and. Uh, with our, our thoughts, you know, going down the path of the next biennium on the, the next legislative session uh, uh, and looking into the next legislative session, we may or may not have uh, a, a very friendly, uh, financially friendly uh, legislative session coming up and we know what the next biennium looks like. So uh, that was kind of where I was yeah. leaning towards is, is figuring out the TRE and and how this plays a part in, and it looks like that one penny goes away. So, uh, well, Dr. Do, the, do we know what the, the, what the go ahead? Uh, I just, I'm curious, do we know what the balance is on that bond fund for the IT of the 19 million? Um, from it, May, it was like 1.9. That sounds right. It was in last month's packet, we didn't include it this, this month. 1.889. So you have the 1.8 and like 3.3, so you have about 5.2. But my question with the bond funds, Dr. Kelly, is does that, if we leverage out, like, um, what's the word? Basically, if we're paying out the laptops and we're collecting interest rate kind of on the laptops, 
because we're making payment over time and we're paying out interest for taking this bond money, are we sort of financially not making the wisest decision by just not paying it all off at the get go if we're going to use bond funds? Oh, I see. Well, bond funds are 25 years, right? Yeah, but do you want to? That's what I'm saying. Is do you want to? That's wanna what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree with something you. for 25 years. Being charged interest. Yeah, I being agree charged with you. interest. That's yeah, you can say that money. You know, to me, the, the way I look at the bond proceeds is it's a possibility, but it is something that we would need to bring back to you at a future point if we thought that that's the best use of that money. Uh, right now, I think it's more to me. Uh, I thought of all this in terms of fund balance. What would our fund balance look like now if we did this? What would it look like in the next biennium? Right. Uh, I, I think that's a safer way to look at it, but I like the fact that, you know, Crystal and Jeff brought up that bond proceeds are at least a possibility should we need it or decide on it. I mean, we did have that in the 2016 bond, that technology was a huge part of that bond. So it wouldn't be without the scope of what the taxpayers approved. But the 25 year funds kind of give you a little heartburn when you consider using that funds. Yeah, if right. we can help from it, I think it would be beneficial. I, I would agree. say that, that, that to, to Jeff's point, and, and we've had some very long discussions, he and I, even here in technology, when you're talking something like a laptop or an iPad and you're using a 25, 30 year debt instrument for that, he's always been a little adverse to that. And with what Georgiani is presenting to you as a way to use regular. 199 general operating funds, which is what Jeff has been trying to get us to for a long time. Um, uh, it, you're right, Ms. Decker, that there are interest charges um, on the laptops, not on the iPads. Um, it, it just kind of, it's kind of hard. Yeah, I, also I want to clarify, if I, Dr. Kelly, if I can clarify one thing, um, that extra penny that we're going for that requires a unanimous board approval is already part of the budget that we built. Okay, so it's not in addition to. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. No, I, I just, yeah. You know, and uh, two things about the bond, just to wrap that discussion up. Rebecca, correct me on, on this if I'm wrong, but I think when we were selling the bond and making those presentations, we were hopeful in 2016 that we would not have to go back to the voters for 10 years. I think that's what we said. It's either yeah. That's exactly what we did. Eight to 10 years. And I've been hoping that, that we would continue with that. And the second thing is, so in other words, what I'm saying is a lot of districts are paying for technology, big jumps with bond proceeds. But I was hoping to avoid something like that uh, for a decade. Uh, the second thing is that I, I'm not familiar with this because we weren't proposing a bond election, but in the last legislative session, they began to curtail uh, bond expenditures for, as Crystal said, when you've got a bond for a long uh, a long-term bond for something that has a short uh, shelf shelf life so there are beginning to be some restrictions on that that does not affect what we've already passed and the money we have on hand now but it would if, if we were to uh, look yeah, at that. it it wanted the last 10 years or longer which is a long shelf life for technology Dr. Kelly. and certainly it's hard to get an endpoint device like a computer to last that long well, and I would, I, and I guess you could argue too that we're saying that these are four year devices. And man, at the end of four years, I think these devices are going to look pretty rough yep. in, in the hands of 20,000 students, you know? Um, I would agree with you. Uh, I still, there'll, there'll be a portion of them that will still be in pretty good shape um, just by the law of averages, Jeff. We would simply take the ones that we could, we could use effectively turn those into testing computers because there we just need the, the lockdown browser so that teachers could use that for modeling testing throughout the year and build that fleet up because using one-to-one -one for testing uh, can open us up for some possible irregularities in testing. If we bring a device in and, and re-image it, we don't know that we've got them all. It's hard for a testing coordinator to know when kids are walking in with laptops if that one's been re-imaged in, in lockdown or not. It just causes a lot of problems. And I, I think this needs to be looked at more of as an instructional solution and not something that will solve our, our online testing. Mr. Bakken, you had a question. Mr. Bakken. OK, 
Okay, we'll open it. Back. No, I, I'm I, I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay, I couldn't find my button on here. Um, a couple of questions for Georgiani real quick, and then I'll get into uh, some other statements and questions about technology. Uh, on is the laptops that I guess that's the Dell 3310s. They are a is that a touch screen also? No, sir. Okay. Well, and, and answer why not. Uh, we do not buy touchscreens because touchscreens have a higher failure rate. Uh, we don't put touchscreens in our laptop carts. What we did is we settled on the device that we actually use on our campuses. That's what they're used to using, and and that's the direction we chose to take in this in this manner. So so if it if if a student wants to, you know, work on handwriting, draw art, things like that, the the complete touchscreen is completely out of the question. I mean. Because I, the reason why I ask that is I know several districts that have gone to a Dell computer that looks much like the 3310, but it also serves as a touch screen. And if we're going to be doing some distance learning and things like that, the art students, the, you know, there's lots of things that can be done on the touch screen that can't be done on a regular laptop. And I, I was I was hoping that these would be those, but I guess I, I was wrong on that. So is there a significant price difference in that or? Yeah, you'd easily be adding over $2 million to your acquisition costs. Okay. Well, the other argument I heard from technology was that they'd be constantly repairing them because of the hinge uh, that turns them into a tablet. Now, I don't, I don't know how accurate that is, but that's one of the things I heard technology say. Okay. Lance, um, may, Lance may I uh, piggyback sure. on the question because sure. I haven't seen the return? And uh, sure. Mr. Barte, Dr. Reeves, I wanted to ask y'all about the learning management system that we're using for the uh, elementary schools is, of course, Seesaw, right? Right. And, and uh, Seesaw is extremely tactile. And uh, just when I observed my daughter using it, she never did use a laptop for it. Everything was um, I'm just going to mark up my work. And she was using a uh, an iPad, right? And so did you consider going with touchscreen device or a um, iPad for pre-K through four, since they're going to be using Seesaw, which is, like I said, highly tactile. That was part of our discussion of the, the folks in CNI. Uh, and initially, we came up with a solution that, that was really more pre-K through two. Uh, it was universally requested that laptops be given to students in the second grade because it had more to do with improving their use of the keyboard on a, on a computer and using an actual computer versus something that's more of an app-based type device. Dr. Reeves, would you like to weigh in on that? Uh, I know you're doing that. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, for our younger students, our pre-K, kinder, and first grade. Amber's my biggest deal is I'm sorry. Who's talking? That was that was uh, someone uh, just needed to mute. Okay, we're good. Okay, so good. for our pre-K, kinder, and first grade students, we wanted a device that would be more developmentally appropriate for that small, small tactile, uh, kinesthetic type touch. Um, that's why when we spoke with uh, curriculum and instruction, we talked about how using uh, seesaw using the app would be more appropriate. And then once the students get into the second grade, the type to learn uh, program was very important because that is one of the requirements that we have for our elementary kids to go through that um, keyboarding software. And that's why, again, with the iPad, it's going to have a keyboard, but also with our second through uh, 12th grade students, they will have the ability to, to do that typing as well. Okay. So is uh, it a um, turn app not available for the iPad unit? No, the I, the iPad does have an app for C. It does have a type to learn and it could have keyboard access. It will, yes. So if we used it at second grade to fourth grade, we would still have access to the type to learn piece? Yes, you do. You do through the web browser. But on the if we used an iPad versus the, the Dell. For your second through fourth grade students? Yes, ma'am. So yes, you would still have access to that app. Um, in talking with curriculum and instruction, the reason that they wanted um, students from second to fourth grade to have the tablet was so that they could get used to 
the bigger keyboard and the you know more permanent finger placement um, instead of and moving them away from apps so to speak and more into uh, using right yeah. exactly using yeah. the and, online and there are iPads still on campus um, that we just put out over the last two years uh, and they are the 128 gig uh, iPads are so the bigger ones uh, it, it's it's kind of a balance between the two we were trying to meet requirements that were coming from our instruction folks uh, and they they spent a lot of time considering what they needed to do uh, we had lots of uh, meetings with them, uh, teams meetings, and when the decision was made, it was actually a unanimous decision. So um, it's just what they felt was best, and we agreed with it based on the criteria that they were trying to achieve or the things that they were trying to do with the students. It has to do with more, it's different using an app-based platform than it is an actual PC-type Windows device. Okay, so so I, I'm just... Um straightforward person so I'm just going to say it uh, so I agree with the pre-k through second grade I guess it, through first grade maybe yes, with the tablets yeah, okay I'm sorry the iPads and then um, I, I've also been a big proponent for many years about keyboarding learning simple I say simple things as using the Microsoft um, uh, office platform you know word PowerPoint yes. you know all of those things so that's very extremely important so when you get into second and Second grade, I do agree with the CNI department about uh, what y'all stated earlier that they said that they wanted the keyboard. That's extremely important because I have a senior or I have a, a girl that uh, senior in college that had to teach herself for the most part keyboarding because it all wasn't always offered in school. So I think it's very important that that gets done. But I also think it's equally important that we have a touch screen um, for uh, on the Dell. I, I have not heard. Um, and I've done some extensive research about the hinges and, it, you know, about it being turned backwards. I have several districts that use them that haven't had any issues with them. As a matter of fact, um, I use a very similar device uh, and they continue to touch my touch screen and it doesn't use that. <laughs> I don't have a touch screen on mine. So I would heavily uh, like to see that because uh, as Charles mentioned, you know, there are a lot of tactile things as a, Formal tactile learner myself, um, and I have two of my my own children are like that. I, I would definitely like to see a touch screen. If we're going to make this, you know, make this big purchase, I, I at least got to feel comfortable about it. Um, so I definitely like to look in that. I don't know if if it'd be a two million dollar. Um, I think that's that number may be you know misquoted. Uh, you know, um, Mr. Barte, I don't know, but I'd like to get more information on that. Um, okay, so. So on the bond money from the past, um, just to wrap my brain around this, what we spent, uh, I guess it was around $20 million. And Mr. Barte, you can help me out here. It, it was on infrastructure and a phone system for all teachers, correct? And then teacher tablets and replacing all of the um, old, uh, old computers and things like that in the teacher's classroom. Is that correct? Uh, you're partially correct. Okay. Um, Can you help me help me understand sure, that? Sure. I have the spreadsheet right in front of me, the, the one we sent you guys last month. Uh, okay. we, replaced, we replaced all of the laptop carts and doubled the number of laptop carts that were on our existing campuses. Uh, again, trying to increase all of the uh, availability because when we looked at the sign-in sheets, because teachers would have to log or sign out uh, or register for those laptop cards, they were they were constantly in use. So we needed to increase that. Uh, the next one was all the student computers. We still had computers out there that were from 2000, 2001. Okay. And we replaced all of those. Uh, the teacher desktop computers needed to be replaced because we were adding in the interactive projectors, uh, which have all been installed. That was another part that we did. Then we doubled the number of the iPad cards on all the campuses. Okay. And okay, it's coming back to me now. <laughs> and we I just got it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. We refreshed all the teacher tablets and we gave them the, uh, the, the Dell version of the, the Surface, the Microsoft Surface, and put it in a case with an interactive pen and, a, and an actual keyboard uh, that stayed attached while the case was in place to try to better protect the device. Uh, we did uh, two in one tablet devices for all the campus administrators out there. 
Uh, we replaced uh, special programs computers and PPC okay. life skills with touchscreen computers. Mm -hmm. uh, we upgraded computers for all the, the, the computers that were the transition cottage and added to what they currently had. Uh, we did add an iPad cart uh, per GT for the GT Academy at, at Savile Tour and at West. Uh, we built out two general ed computer classrooms at Turner because they were most of the others were designated for CTE classes with the general classes like English and math, and they didn't have access to computer labs. Uh, we built uh, uh, the gas added interactive Mimeos and ceiling mounted projectors. Okay. It's all before we get to any kind of infrastructure. Sure. Yeah. So, so on on the on the I saw in the uh, packet about the phone system, and that, that we're up that was up again this year is that correct how much is that being utilized i mean i know it's the safety issue uh, with all that but i'm trying to wrap my brain around um uh is that a three-year contract that we we just agreed to is that correct no sir it is not uh, there we, we, we i'm are, sorry we are wrapping up a seven-year lease with uh um, that's what it was u.s yeah. bank that is not part of the bond projects at all what we okay. did was upgraded the hardware that that virtual platform runs on. So once we complete the lease, the the, the phone system is ours, and that hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars that we pay every year comes back to our our general operating budget. Um, all we did was upgrade the software and the hardware they ran. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It, it's now it's now the newest, latest, greatest that we have, and it will now allow us to interface interface with the Breeze platform that we're doing for the security project. Okay, and so with the with the, the Wi-Fi and all the and I, I use the word infrastructure because that's what you have always told you know explained it to us. So with all the new laptops coming on or uh, tablets and all this, if we move forward with this, you're y'all are telling us that we are prepared for this as far as the additional uh, devices that'll be on uh, coming on. Is that correct or well, ready for it? I guess I don't understand your question when you say we're prepared. I mean, I mean, from with, the infrastructure. The bandwidth, the, the bandwidth and all the Wi Fi capabilities and all that kind of stuff is what he's talking about. Um, good, good point. Our Wi Fi access points uh, can do 5,000 megs. They used to do 400 megs. Uh, we just increased that this last uh, fall. Uh, we are in the process now of, of deploying the multi rate switch that will do the five gigs or the 5,000 megs. Uh, we'll have that done before the start of school. We have documentation from Aruba. I sent that over to Mr. Berger. Uh, they can simultaneously, each access point, log on 1,028 users. Uh, we also tweaked the system and did a health check on it to bump it up to what they call the 80 gigahertz, which allows for faster logons and logouts. So the system that we have is the latest and greatest in Wi-Fi. Uh, what they call the AX Wi-Fi 6 platform. So the Wi-Fi piece will be ready and, and capable of handling it. Uh, but again, it's an ongoing maintenance issue as with any. Okay. You know, you know uh, uh, Lance, I think um, relating this back to this particular item on the agenda, um, we, we did really well with d distributing hotspots to, okay. to uh, parents or families that did not have access to the internet. And so we think we have a, you know, a good grasp of how many of those would be needed for the coming school year. We think we're in good shape there. Um, we, our, our school district and Greg Bartain his shop did a really great job there because a lot of districts uh, couldn't get there and they were basically uh, backlogged on getting devices and, and getting what they needed. Whereas we had a really good system in place and the people that needed those hotspots got them and we think it's going to be a fairly constant number as we go into the future. I thank you for that, yeah. that Dr. Kelly but the best part about that is we didn't have to pay for it it came from a grant from Team Hope. <laughs> okay, yeah um, so so uh, you know I've always been for the one-to-one -one technology for a long you know many years um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm all for it I, I just uh, the, you know, I'm a big vision guy, so I have to see what it kind of looks like from the far and work backwards, right? And so the frustrating part, and, and, and then I don't know if it's anybody's fault inside the technology department, but, you know, always having a vision or a plan in place to where we want to be, where we want to go, what, you know, what it's going to look like. And I know we're kind of thrust into this, but, you know, uh, I've always wanted to see what the end result, you know, wanted to be. So, I know that Mr. Berger is ultimately in charge of, of this department, 
And so I feel comfortable. I know Mr. Berger, um, uh, I've worked with him uh, before when I was a teacher. So I, I, I feel confident that the vision will be there and, and will come back. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, I feel really good about it. So I have no further questions, except I would like to look at the touchscreen. Well, the only thing I'll say about the touchscreen, uh, and I, I refer or defer to Dr. Reeves, is that she has gathered input from lots of folks to determine what basically most uh, would like. Now, if you ask 1,300 teachers which instrument they prefer, you might get 600 different answers. But we they worked through a process to get what they thought was the best combination of capabilities for a particular instrument. And that's where this Dell product came up. It isn't perfect, you know, it, it may not have this, but it does have that, you know. Hey, any other trustees wanna open it up for other questions? I have a few questions. Um, first of all, with the iPads, I'm glad the decision for 28 gigs is going through. I was prepared to mount an aggressive uh, uh, defense there, you know, 32 is just not enough, but I'm really glad about that. Um, and, and so if we do go one-to-one, -one, and I think Charles sent an email with a question, or rather Dr. Kelly sent us an email with an answer to Charles's question earlier this week, was that there's no, we're not going back to pre-COVID Parallel ISD, right? right? There won't be more paper textbooks. Um, and and you know, I'm all for that. Uh, my, my fear though, is if we go one-to-one, -one, someone's just gonna leave this computer um, in, in their room the whole year and use their own personal laptop, uh, which they might prefer, right? Um, and so I guess, how, will, one, will it be mandatory for all students to check out a laptop? Well, I have made George Annie's life much more complicated by bringing up some of these options that we're not ready to, to decide tonight. But for example, as she's pointed out, you know, what about the senior? Um, should, we, should we give a option to parents to purchase the computer. I was suggesting at half price. We get away from the lease and we just basically say, uh, you, you can purchase it for 250 bucks and it's yours. And then we don't have the commitment to the four-year lease. But as uh, Virginia pointed out, it's not a perfect answer. What about uh, you know, with, with the senior who graduates under a lease, you turn around and you give that same computer to a, an entering kindergartner or, or, or an entering second grader. So there's things like that, that in this rush to make sure that maybe we have something in place by August, there are still, still decisions like that that lay out ahead, Michael, that uh, we're continuing to work through before we, and that's part of the reason I asked that in the motion that you uh, delegate some responsibility there to me for these purchasing decisions, because we do have some other things to work through as to whether or not there is a better deal uh, out there and whether, you know, as she, she mentioned earlier, whether we really need, if we're gonna have 21,600 students, if we really need all that many machines or whether uh, there's a provision for parents who say, no thanks, I've got what I need. And so it, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities that instead of 20,000 computers, we might buy 10,000. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay, so, so the number is still very flexible. Okay, that, that, that was one thing. And I guess that whole, granted, sorry, go ahead. Granted, the preferred thing to do is that we have a standardized system so that way technology is able to push everything through, right? Um, so that is a challenge. Um, mandatory, you would have to use this specific computer. That's for your, uh, I, would, I would say in response to that, Mike, um, it's hard for me to make you use a certain device when you're at home. Um, I, I don't know of any way for me to insist on that when you're just logging in uh, to the cloud, to an LMS and doing your work and submitting it. What is important is that when the district puts in a, as Dr. Kelly described it, a very robust and, and rigorous online platform, we have given the students all the tools they need to be able to do what they're required to do and what we expect them to do rather than relying upon maybe mom and dad just sharing something or, or providing something on their own. And maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. Um, some of the comments that I saw in the, in the survey from the parents uh, that came back from devices and from the utilization of devices, there were, parents would go out and buy things like Chromebooks and only to dis dis discover that they did not do what they really needed to do. Um, you know, you're relying on someone else to buy a device 
that may or may not, or provide advice that may or may not meet the needs, the instructional needs that we require as a district and to maintain the standards, the high standards that our district always has. So in this perspective, I would tell you, I'm not a fan of wasting money, but we need to be serious right. about providing the students all the tools that they need to do what we require them to do. Now, yeah. if they choose not to, I don't know how to stop that. Right, I agree with you. And the reason I'm asking these questions is because if we do go one-to-one, -one, yes, sir. the whole package, right, it makes a TRE almost inevitable, right, that we're going to have to do it uh, in order not just to sustain uh, our, our, our fund balance, but also so that we can, uh, in the future, upgrade these devices, you know, without having to, to necessarily take out bond. Okay, um, so I, I'm just, I'm, thank you for, for letting me know where you guys were on that. Um, and to your question, Mr. Bakken, I just got a text back from Dell to add the touchscreen as a roughly $110 a unit. That's about what I came in at. That's a little more than $2 million for the, the fleet. They happen to be on the call, by the way. Any other questions? I have some. Shocking. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so starting with the iPads versus laptop piece, I think what I hear you saying is that by second grade, it's not necessarily because I'm looking at it from a financial position too, if we can use iPads up through fourth grade, we're saving a significant amount of money going the iPad route versus going the laptop route. Actually, you're not. It costs more per unit by the time you license yeah. it, and it's $564 for the iPad right. solution versus uh, less than $500 for the, for the laptop. Okay. So, so if you, roughly about the same, maybe $30 difference. Yeah. Okay. So, and plus what I hear Miss Reeves saying is that at second grade, you're kind of teaching the fundamentals of using that laptop. So you're teaching essentially the analogy I've been using is up to third grade, you're teaching kids to read and by third grade, you're reading to learn. So the same sort of concept with the laptop, you're if you have the laptop at use, you're actually teaching the fundamentals of how to open a Microsoft Office document, how to save that document, how to move files around, kind of getting that fundamentals of how to use a computer at that point. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely. And the other piece that goes along with that is the Office 365 that is now available for all of our students. And so by the time they reach second grade and beyond, they can be using some of those more advanced features and functionality like OneNote, Classroom Notebook, um, Teams, some of those tools that would be more conducive to having some of that uh, synchronous learning. Okay. Um, and if I could have, I have this thought process about kind of purchasing and where to go with it. And I need some feedback from Dr. Kelly really about, um, I hear from you that our long-term goals are to have a full immersion of technology into our curriculum. But I'm worried because I worry that teachers and are going to hear that that's the goal for right now. And I, from what I'm hearing from you, your short-term goal is to have access to technology for every student. Uh, my short-term goal is that for those kids that are uh, learning uh, distance, you know, that they're learning at home, whether that's the entire district or just the, the, the parents, that they have a very comfortable and easy way to access the, the, the instructional software. On the, for the campus teacher, <clears throat> I see, I don't wanna call it baby steps, but there are, we're gonna to have to gradually integrate what they do in the past with making sure that when a kid is at home, as opposed to being in the campus, that it's a pretty seamless transition. Right. which means more use of technology and more use of those apps than we have now, but a realization that it's going to take some time. And so uh, the immediate goal that Dr. Reeves and, and Greg Barté and the others are, are putting in place are, are uh, the minimum capabilities that a teacher should have as we enter into the school year. And that's a familiarity with uh, Canvas, uh, familiar with um, uh, Seesaw. And I know I'm leaving something out, uh, Laura, but those are the two that come to mind. Those were the big two along with Microsoft 365 because with uh, Canvas, uh, Microsoft 365 is fully integrated. 
And then as I just mentioned, now that all of our students have that, that gives the capability for the video conferencing along with all of those other tools. Okay. Um, and so really what's happening online in say Canvas, um, if, a, if a teacher has developed her course or his course, then whether they're face-to-face -face or remote, that content, those activities, uh, anything that you're having the students do, all of that information is readily available to them regardless of if they're in the classroom or at home. So here's the anxiety I have if I'm stepping into a teacher's shoes and I am uncertain about my entire curriculum, say I've been teaching for three to five years or whatever, or I'm a brand new teacher and I have a curriculum and a daily lesson plan that I've already cultivated over years that doesn't have technology fully integrated into that lesson plan. I know that's where we're moving, but I don't, that's already going to be a, a hiccup between moving between here and educating those in distance learning. And then if there's this big push right now to fully get everything onto Canvas and make that versus, so I'm, I'm anxious for our teachers and how that looks from their standpoint, and they're already going to be taxed with doing things so differently um, in educating our students. How does that work, and what are our goals for technology right now for teachers? Well, uh, you know, we're we're undeveloped in some areas. I don't mean to take away from what CNI is doing and Laura without a doubt and all that. But uh, for instance, one of the thoughts I had the other day is that basically, if you're if the governor is allowing every student that wants to to stay at home, then what percentage of all the courses, subjects, grade levels, and stuff, we have the ability to provide that via distance learning? And if we don't, what would it take to provide it? Or alternatively, what do we say to a, to a kid and a parent? I'm sorry, that course is not available online. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of issues like that mm -hmm. that remain to be worked through. Now, you know, Today, the commissioner mentioned the Texas Virtual School Network, which offers a whole bunch of courses for getting through. But whether that's a viable solution for us um, remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. I mean, I think we have a certain level of excellence that we have set a standard to that we're hoping to achieve even in the distance learning model. And I applaud curriculum and instruction and I've been following kind of what they've been pushing out. And I think that's a model to move towards in the future where students are watching videos from home, learning content, and then you're checking for knowledge as you move back into the classroom environment. And I think we have, it's an exciting place for us to be in given our, what we are so good at and mirroring that and partnering with, with education or with technology. And, and I'm hesitant, like if the short term goal in the technology piece, I guess I'm thinking about it two ways that if we're just looking to get devices in kids' hands, then we may be able to stair step into buying as many laptops as we're gonna eventually need over time and moving towards the one-to-one -one device, but just having a short-term goal of getting a device for everyone, spend that money and then move towards what a full robust technology integration looks like and continue purchasing those items as needed over time. But maybe I'm thinking, I don't, I, there's probably some errors in my logic there. So, so may I address a couple of things yes. that you're, so, and in, in this goes to the collaboration with Dr. Watson and Bonnie Scheidt and Don Lissy and Dr. Uh, Lakeisha Vaughn. We have, um, since this pandemic, we have been working in partnership to not only um, train our teachers, work with our teachers with what this looks like in the online environment, but we've also developed for Canvas in particular, um, course structures with scope and sequence. And we have set up training that will be occurring um, from July to into the beginning of the school year into September okay. um, to bring all of our teachers on board who have not, because we've trained a good majority of our teachers using Canvas and Seesaw. Um, but what we are going to do is work with our teachers to do just exactly what you were talking about and create those lessons and for, for you know, periods of time for 
the, the first three weeks or the first okay. six weeks, nine weeks, whatever. But the other part of that is that we have a group of instructional specialists, the CNI instructional specialists, the educational technology specialists, the advanced academic specialists that have all gone through training for these learning management systems and can assist teachers and be that support in the online environment. So we're we're not just saying, oh, here's all these tools, right. go forth and use them. Yeah, go forth, create your use. But what I hear you saying is you have a skeleton in place that they can add their color and flavor to Absolutely. for their unique classroom and their unique, they can go out and find extra links for extra learning and all those kinds of things for their particular relationship with their students in their classroom. Absolutely. And we have some teachers who have their courses. You know, this isn't our first year for Canvas. We've been using Canvas for going on eight years. So we've got some teachers who have beautiful, fully developed courses that they will be able to continue to enhance and tweak for their students for, you know, the as long as they are teaching those classes. So we're not starting with a blank slate with everything and just saying, here's here are these tools, go forth and use them. We're providing that support. And that support will also be provided for parents. Like, will there be um, kind of a public relations initiative pushed out to parents saying, here's some training modules for you to get used to how to support your student? Yes, yeah. ma'am. So a couple things that we have learned through the course of, of the quarantine was that parents want to at least have that information of, of what's going on in their class. So we worked with Canvas in order to have the parent pairing, and we'll be pushing all of that information out um, along with some instructional videos and also, uh, documents. Also, uh, Crystal, Kim Hoka, um, in the survey that we're doing out to parents, ask some of those questions. How many uh, of you would like training on these particular things? Yeah. I can't remember exactly what we asked, but we're trying to get into that. Yep. I guess the other Oh, sorry. I was going to ask Crystal. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. Go ahead, JB. I was going to ask you, um, were, was your question geared more towards the actual stair-stepping of the cost of the physical devices or, or stair-stepping of the actual training materials on those devices? Because I believe they have devices now, not one-to-one. Yeah. -one. They, they're in the BY, bring your it, own. It's connection. sort of a, a partnership because I don't, even though they um, have BYOB, I don't think all teachers across our district are utilizing Canvas. I mean, we're moving towards that now, but they didn't have that. Not all teachers were utilizing those tools that they had at their disposal prior to this implementation of now we need to use it. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a, it, it's a partnered question because I think there's an opportunity to possibly stair step in, but that as I'm talking through it, and I, this is what I'd hoped that you guys would do, um, I think the other part of it is the learning opportunity for kids because there needs to be a uniform platform for teachers to say, if I'm using my parents' Apple Apple book or whatever they're called, I don't use Apple, but um, <laughs> tell me again. The MacBook. Yes, MacBook, thank you. If I'm using my parents' MacBook, I can't tell my student, go to the start menu, scroll up to Microsoft Office, click on Microsoft Word, and have a uniform response from all of the students in my classroom. So there, I think there's benefit from a teaching model of having a uniform device that we push out to everyone at the same time. And, and Crystal, I, I would say that we've been working with uh, Ms. Weimer and, and a, which, what they call the silo committee, and it was putting together what the district identified as non-negotiables. And one of those non-negotiables that we talked about back in the fall before COVID kind of forced our hand was all teachers needed to be trained and utilizing Office 365. All the teachers from five grade, grade five and up needed to be using Canvas. So those things were already in motion and moving in that direction anyway. This is just really accelerate that it's process. It's a catalyst for making it happen faster kind of right. thing. Necessity is the mother of invention. That's how I put a lot of it. Well, to the, to the point, Dr. Kelly, is, is, you know, with working with Nan and, and Nyla and some of the others on the committee, I, I think there was a vision there. and We saw where we needed to go. We were moving in that direction and COVID just kind of pushed. Just kind of really brought it to, to the surface of how much we really needed to do that. So. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Reeves, um, question on the tablets that the teachers have right now um that we got them you said 
or I know Mr. Barté said something that they're like a, a surface. It, if if the kids are going to get the thirty three ten and they have a tablet, do they? I know it's made by the same company, but do they look exactly the same? Is everything on the feature on them the same? And so they're speaking the same language. The Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. they're they're Windows devices. Yes. Okay. They they are a full blown Windows device. Um, the reason we gave the teachers tablets is because they have the action text, which allow them to be mobile in their classroom um, and to be interactive in their classroom when delivering their instruction. Which is why we chose that. The the case actually has a large elastic strap that allows them to put their hand through it and move throughout their classroom as they're talking, not sitting behind their desk or stationary somewhere in their, in their room. So, so is that, but that comes with the keyboard component on it or just the tablet at all? Yes, it does. No, sir. Okay. It has an interactive, uh, okay. pen and it has a keyboard oh. that they can keep attached to it. Yes. And, and, and they are, since, since we've given those out to the teachers and I'm assuming that, uh, they feel more comfortable and, and you know, we get good positive feedback on all those. I know because probably COVID probably pushed that fast forward pretty quick, but um, is, that, is that correct? Yes, they, they were all scrambling, they were all okay. scrambling to get their, their uh, tablets they had left in their rooms when all this kind of hit. As soon as we allowed them to come up to the campuses, they were getting up there to get those tablets uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it, it's a, it's like I say, it's a pretty robust device. It has all the same kinds of resources that their large two-in-one or their all-in-one has on their desk. Uh, and we did that intentionally so it would be the exact same performance that they saw sitting at their desk. Well, let me you know, open the floor. Uh, 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 sorry, Mr. Bakken. Let me, let me open up the floor to Trustee Decker, Trustee Murphy. Um, I, we Just to make sure that you all had any input or any questions that you wanted to, uh, to raise. If not, no problem. Just wanted to make sure you had a chance to hop in. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Bakken, you want to finish up and let's um, let's let's kind of draw some conclusion type uh, questions. Yes, sir. Hey, I, I mean, I just my two cents is I I think we're in a different time with this pandemic, and I think, from my opinion, again, that it's inevitable that you know you're gonna to have to shut down schools or classrooms and, and you're gonna to have to at some point go to a hybrid or distant learning. So going to the you know one-to-one -one device, it makes sense in a, in a sense that you're going to have to have kids at home at some point, um, whether it be a classroom or a whole school or anything like that. So you know, I don't know how you get away from this and I just don't know how you um, look at the funding mechanism possibly from the bond fund from IT uh, or what the best, best possible method is, but I just don't foresee going into this fall semester as long as we still have COVID, how you're not falling into some kind of hybrid model or a full online model um, in the fall school year. And that's just what I think, but I think you've just got to be ready for it. And I think this is probably uh, the most important thing that we do is going one-to-one. -one. Okay, thank you, sir. And I, I want to add to that because yes, I completely sir. agree with, with Murphy. Um, but just like Mike said, you know, I don't, we're not going to ever go back to what Pearland ISD was before. We've, we've, we've jumped through another hoop, right? So um, I think that our teachers have learned a lot. Our, our staff has learned a lot, you know, and I think our students now too, um, they, they've proven in some form that they can, they can do things remotely and do things things great I mean there's a lot of really cool things that are happening still um, using technology so I think that if this doesn't go through that we're doing a disservice because it, it you know we're just trying along with the COVID the, you know it, it is inevitable I think that we will be shutting down a school here or there so you know it, it needs to happen but um, but we're not going to be going back to the normal because the, the, it is a new normal now so hey Mr. Floyd you had anything raised yeah, thank you. So, so I, I, I wanted to go back to what um, um, Becky was talking about with kind of like understanding, you know, it, with some like finality, like what the vision is that was struck between tech and, and curriculum and, and everything that we've been pushing for, you know, a couple of years now. Um, I got a great question from a parent, you know, does the laptop, does it come to school and go back? Um, you know, do, what, what is, I mean, is it just like a normal, 
desktop that you would find in a classroom or like a laptop part is identical in terms of like software to that, right? I mean, and what does the vision look like? How integrated is it? Um, and of course, you know, I might be getting way ahead of this. We need, may need to be thinking about that once we actually have them, but what is the vision, um, if that can even be described? And when you're, you're talking about the vision, I, I wanna make sure that I am completely cl clear with what you're asking. Are you asking about a vision for online learning, given the situation that we're in, or a vision for how the students will use the technology that we're giving them? Yeah, I, and I don't want to be insensitive to the current situation we're in with the coronavirus, but I'm looking beyond the coronavirus. I'm looking at what happens when there's no pandemic. How are these one-to-ones being used on a day-to-day -day basis for so students? For me, for, for someone in educational technology, that vision is that it becomes just like if they had to carry their um, supplies back and forth to the classroom. It Agreed. becomes part of what they are doing and how they are going about um, uh, submitting assignments or taking quizzes or collaborating with their classmates. Mm -hmm. It just becomes that seamless part of what the classroom now looks like. You know, one other thing I'll add to that, Mike, is um, higher education, as you well know, has moved almost, you know, so far down the road as compared to the public schools where most of the content is provided online, in some cases, all of it. Um, and so it is good to prepare our students to face that future. 100% agree. Mike, that was a great question, man. Uh, that was pretty much where I was gonna go and just wanting to know, hey, is it just so we can get through the pandemic or is this is we're we're changing and, and we're, if it's long-term sustainable change, I'm 100% in. Dr. Reeves, I want to ask you one more question about those touch screens. Yes, Did you come to the, uh, to the decision on the touch screens based upon the functionality or the cost, right? So did the cost run everybody off or did you, we, we really want, we really don't want the touch screens. We really want the, Correct. yeah. yeah. You it, see what it, I'm became, from? it became a functionality issue. And it okay. also, in part of that, you, you also have to look at um, the factors of, um, you know, with a, with a younger student, um, being able to take care of a touch screen versus something that's a little more rugged, right? Okay. Because most of your touch screens are that, the, the slicker, um, glass type surface. So you look at functionality and then you look at the cost. Okay. So, okay, great. So functionality was, cause I didn't want that two million dollars to stand in the way of us getting what we really wanted but if the if these 33 tens are what we really want then I, I'm, I'm in so I want to go back to the financing thing like we have bond funds available right but the three or four million dollars in bond funds that we have if we use those to buy these uh, devices we don't have to issue those as 25 year debt am I correct we can issue that at a different term or is that a fixed, if you issue those dollars, they have to be? All the bonds have been sold, so there's nothing to issue. Right? Oh, that's now right, that's just. That's that's money we already got. You're right, you're right, you're right. There's nothing yeah. else going out. Okay. All right, well that blows that out of the water. No matter, that's 25 years. Okay, great, all right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd rather rather buy, you know, steel and concrete with uh, 25 year debt. Mr. But, Mr. Gooden? Um, yes, sir. Could, could I add one thing to, to what Mike was addressing? In discussions with Dr. Kelly uh, within Cabot and within the Return to School Committee, one thing that he has made very clear to all of us is that when we come back and we're doing online learning and we're using Canvas as the LMS for, for grades five up and Seesaw for the lowers, that needs to be used in the classroom. So that if something happens, whether it's a resurgence of COVID or some other thing where we have to go to remote, it becomes a more seamless transition. So going forward, there is a vision that how we deliver instruction and what our expectations are in instruction are much different than they were prior to COVID. It needs to be and should be a seamless side-by-side -side what they're doing online and what they're doing in the classroom to complement one another consistently so that everything moves in the direction it needs to move, regardless of what the learning environment actually looks like from a physical standpoint. 
But with the sensitivity, uh, the, just one thing, the sensitivity that that Crystal mentioned that we got to walk before we can run on the teacher side. You know, we've got to work these things slowly. And it's not like we're expecting in August that suddenly their entire uh, classroom environment changes to what they're doing on the laptop. Uh, you know, but you described it very well, Greg. I just want to be sensitive, like Crystal was, that this, if a teacher was listening to this, no, we're not expecting you to have your entire world. Uh, ready to go on the laptop by by August 30th. Right. I, I was trying to speak to Michael's question about vision. Yes. Um, usually speak more long term. Um, yes. and, and I think you have articulated a very clear vision to all of us. And that's kind of that's that would be the answer, I think, to that question. Yes, Dr. Oh, Kelly, anyway. may I add oh, something, anyway. please? Uh, yeah, Dr. Watson, C and I. Yes. Yes, please. Um, most of the textbooks and resources that we buy now have many electronic resources that we are incorporating and we have not used them to the full capacity because we did not have one-to-one -one in the classroom and having one-to-one -one in the classroom will enable teachers to teach at a, at a more structured method using technology at the hands of kids and we have not had that capability even though we had access to that in our classrooms. And it was, it's been part of our textbook adoptions and teachers have access to creating documents, but they're doing them on paper instead of doing them with a, with a computer in the classroom because we've not had that for our kids. So this is going to take us to a different level of classroom function. And we have that, we have those resources now. We just need a way to implement them into the classroom. Well said, Dr. Watson. Yeah, and that one, the one thing I would still like to see technology wise is is a schedule, uh, a roadmap schedule uh, for hardware and a refresh rate on software. So there's a life cycle on everything, hardware included, software included. Um, I'd like to understand kind of from a technology standpoint, where do we see uh, this software heading in five years, our hardware going in five years? You know, we mentioned earlier that there's usually a 10 year bond cycle. Well, you know, lo and behold, we're four, four to five years into our current bond, right? So that means five to six years from now, we're going to be, you know, staring down the gun barrel of yet another large ticket item without any kind of, any kind of inkling of kind of where it is we're going from a hardware standpoint and or a software standpoint. We know where we are today. And um, I just need to understand a little bit about or get, get some sort of feel for where we're going. Yeah. And I think maybe Michael was trying to, to mention the same thing. And I just still don't have that warm fuzzy that we have a roadmap for hardware and understanding of, of our hardware. Uh, we have an understanding of our hardware today, but where's our hardware going to be in five or 10 years from now? And then what about our software as far as refresh rates? What's the roadmap associated with those tools? Great, great points. Agreed, hundred uh, percent. I got another question back. So when the TEA brought out the, I guess the, the synchronized and the asynchronized learning, is that correct? Am mm -hmm. I saying? Okay. So, and, and so, if a teacher is has to go um, out, is there a way? And I'm assuming this is correct, but I just want to hear it that they could teach from a makeshift from their house or, or, and talk to the kids in the classroom at the same time on a Zoom conference call or Teams or no? Is that not what that is? Yes, sir. Okay, they well, have the okay. capability in Teams and we have the capability to set up a Teams classroom um, wow. so that they can deliver the synchronous instruction, meaning that it would be something similar to what we're doing right now. And then you okay. also have the ability to do the asynchronous learning, and that would be through your learning management system, either Canvas or Seesaw. Because, you know, the, the, the big thing I noticed uh, through the COVID is, is just, you know, the kids getting online and seeing each other and actually seeing the teacher that was there in the classroom. And I know it was especially for the younger, my, you know, my, my youngest son. It was a big, big deal to see his teacher and go through all that. And they use the Zoom platform. Of course, everybody uses Zoom. And so it's an easy platform for everyone to use. And, uh, you know, I would also like to look into, you know, possibly using that as a platform for the whole district as another alternative. I, 
I don't think it costs very much for the district to 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 have everybody to access to that. But I know I teams is a little more a cost associated with that, whereas uh, teams is free and uh, it's actually to compete with Zoom. Um, they're coming out with a seven by seven, which gives 49 spaces on a screen. And that is you. part of our Microsoft educational licensing. Okay, gotcha. but I, gotcha. I do want to say one thing there because <clears throat> we've, we've given out mixed messages on that. Zoom is not prohibited. A lot of folks are using Zoom uh, in the community and elsewhere. And I'm on Zoom about twice a day, it seems like. So we're not prohibiting it, but we are pushing Microsoft Teams because of its capabilities for what we need. But I, I, I don't want it to be an either or. There will be situations where uh, we also are using Zoom. Members, uh, allow me to kind of um, put the question back before you. We've uh, talked a lot about vision and future costs and ways that we can pay for this. Uh, but uh, what's in front of us is a request from administration uh, to basically in perpetuity uh, go to a one-to-one -one device uh, initiative in the district. And we're talking about uh, roughly 3.1 million per year for, for the hardware. And of course the two technicians will be an additional cost for you know, salaries and benefits. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me put that question to you and um, see if there's any unreadiness to uh, make a decision on it. Um, President Gooden, I do have one um, question. I guess the glory of doing this remotely is that we're able to kind of communicate with people outside of the loop and I'm getting questions from parents about, will I have to commit to a device for my student if I already have a device for them? Um, can I opt out of devices, if, especially if there's a cost involved, but I've purchased this device already. Are we gonna be kind of slow playing that as uh, students enroll in our campuses and the program grows with them? Are, is there going to be an opportunity for students to use their own device? Um, do we have much guidance on that yet? Yeah, I, th I think the short answer, and of course, this, some of this needs more thought, but the short answer is yes, uh, they can use their own device. But what I think you're, I think what parents are going to see over time is it's much more convenient to use right. the device we give them because it's already set up with everything just perfectly for the use of that student at home. So, you know, I, we don't want to force it on them, but I think that they will see, uh, you know, it'd be a lot easier if I used the school's device, especially when we start pushing out software updates and other things. Correct. Yeah, and I understand we're also talking about, you know, potential fees and whatnot. Um, you know, I understand that that can be uh, certainly an issue. Uh, so I know administration is going to be sensitive to, you know, getting this device in everybody's hands so that that's not a stumbling block to anybody who'll say, well, I can't make the fee, so I'm just gonna go without, so. That is correct, yes, sir. Okay. And do we have an understanding of what those fees look like or what they're going to be, like a rough estimate of things? Georgiani? You're muted, Georgiani. Okay. You're muted, Georgiani. <laughs> You're muted. No, I'm not muted. Oh, there you go. Okay, we just couldn't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, I don't know what gotcha. happened, sorry. Um, we are looking at what other districts are doing. There's other, you know, most of the districts that have the one-to-one -one devices, as far as what we've seen, they charge a fee and they range uh, from, you know, $65 to $75 per year. So they, they the fees really do range and then they uh, may have additional charges if they um, uh, damage the device, uh, et cetera. Of course, we're looking for some protection at least for, for the iPads, right? Um, so it's a lot that we have to explore in this little time. And so that's why we're asking um, to allow us to look at all that, put the agreement together, um, see what needs, you know, um, how we want to structure it and then bring it back. And so we'll have the option to say, oh, that's a little much or like we'll have some feedback in that discussion. Okay. Yes. So I will say one thing, uh, kind of coming from this this uh, this world of technology years ago. Um, I'm all for requiring all parents and everyone to have the same device, and the reason is it is because it simplifies the uh, technology piece in understanding exactly what devices they have. 
um, and it, it makes it so much easier and efficient if you know that you're dealing with the, the same software on the same device in the same location. It's kind of similar to what Crystal said earlier. She can tell people exactly where to go, like start, go to the start button, do this, do that. It's very important to be able to do that, and it's it's highly efficient. It may not be the best answer or the answer that people want, but from a district standpoint, we have to protect the integrity of our network. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, right. And realizing that, oh, go ahead, sir. Sorry. I'd we'll just like to refocus it and come back to the question that you asked, right? Which is, I think this is a huge monumental step for the district, but we have to consider how we pay for it and how we sustain the program. And that's when I kind of wanted to, I'm glad we really talked about this first because I don't see how uh, this move and the TRE are, you know, they're so connected, right? Um, and if that was where you're going with the conversation, if not, that's yeah roll with it yeah yeah roll with it i, I think that um it's it's yeah. a what i'm trying to figure out now is how we move into the decision making process and where we want to start right with with approving right because we we approve this uh then this is a well it's at least a four-year uh deal right and um we don't want to spend four years of dollars out of our reserve fund uh to maintain this right we do want to uh, be able to pull that from our operating budget, you know, from, uh, you know, from a uh, TRE. Uh, so uh, just, just give me some feedback guys. If we're, if we're looking at, yes, we're going to add, cause right now what we're going to say is possibly, yes, we're going to add $3.1 million to uh, our budget for the coming fiscal year. And that's going to change, you know, the budget, right? And uh, then we have to talk about what we do in perpetuity along with the, uh, with the TRE. So I'm actually thinking that perhaps we again postpone this, uh, maybe go to the TRE discussion, get a feel for where we are there, then come back to this budget and then uh, bond and um, the, the workshop, uh, the discussion we have to get to. I see Wait, Dan is here, he's, he's gone to doing work because we're, we're holding him, so. With all due yes, respect, um, President Gooden, I yes. think that this, in my opinion, the move for technology needs, I don't, I, I guess I had the question to administration, like if the, if we move forward with the TRE, like let's just be hypothetical, we move forward with that conversation, either there's, not agreement between the board and or we go to a TRE and it doesn't pass, what would it look like to continue to fund this, this initiative over time? Yes. Yeah. Well, Georgian, this. go ahead, Georgian, I'm sorry. Yes, you would have to draw it from fund balance. It's a, it, it'll be a commitment, right? It's a four year commitment at the minimum. And you feel comfortable if we made this decision, like aside from the TRE discussion, is there a comfort level there from you as our CFO that we could maintain that out of fund balance and still be in a healthy financial state? It's a little bit challenging if you couple it with the possibility of the state funding reduction for the next biennium. Mm -hmm. So, uh, George Annie, let me ask you this. Um, if let's just say, for example, we decide that we're going to go move forward with the technology piece, 3.1 million, and we go for the TRE, it doesn't pass. Then can we go next November and add the fifth golden penny to add the 2.5 million? Cause we can't do both. Right. Anyway. Or can we? No, I've, I've been asking that. Uh, go ahead. Dr. Finn. No, I was going to say, we, we would add the fifth golden penny this year for sure. There's just no sweat. But the legislature meets in January, very uncertain what freedom they'll allow or not allow in terms of additional pennies and financing and all that. That's, you know, every, t every two years they change what they're, what they're doing. So I, I don't know what leverage might be there. If they kept the system the same, and I, are you asking, Jeff, if, if the TRE didn't pass, can we maybe do a new TRE next year or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that will stay in place, but I can't guarantee it because the legislature does make big changes every two years. Um, well, we were we were kind of in this position. We've been we've been really living on the edge for the last four years since since I've been on the board. We've we've had a, 
a budget surplus, but um, going into the initial budget, we we were looking at deficits every single year. So, um, you know, I think it's it, we're at a point now where, uh, and I hate to say this, but we need to consider the TRE. Uh, we we need. I, I'm all for the technology, regardless, but we need to consider the TRE primarily not just for this year, but coming years. Um, and we and we can show on paper today with our actual budget. And if we amateurize our budget over the next three to five years, we can show huge deficits in our budget, uh, especially since this biennium is going to be a zero increase, right? Uh, that's my fear. And I think, I think the community would support that. Um, it's just bad time. Mm -hmm. so. And I think what I hear you saying that I agree with is regardless of how the TRE works out, I think this is important enough. And especially at the timing of it, not just for COVID needs, but that is important, but over the long term of the the pivot point for our district becoming even better than we've ever been is integrating technology. And um, I strongly feel that we need to move forward with this commitment. Um, and then I think there is movement to happen on the TRE side. And I'm with you, Jeff. I think our community would be supportive. And I think there's a few strategies that we can consider and talk about, about how to help our citizens understand the importance of why this TRE now versus later. Um, and I think in that long term, once we get to the TRE discussion, I mean, we're talking about a half cent increase over their compression when we go into the next year with the INS rate drop. So um, I think there's a lot of valid points about why to do it now and not to do it later, but separate and apart from, I think technology needs to happen. Agreed. So that's my opinion. Yeah. So I guess where I was going, President Gooden, is I, I feel like maybe we could have this discussion and have a vote on this now, separate and apart from the TRE discussion. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Crystal. You're muted, sir. You're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounds like at least we have some, uh, we, we haven't heard from everybody, but there's some buy-in uh, for, the, for the TRE. And uh, as you mentioned, there's strategies and things and they, that nature that we could uh, employ to actually tell the story, which is what I was saying. There's gotta be a vision behind why we're going for this. We're not just asking for more money just so we can just have more money. Uh, but if um, we, we're, we're on the discussion item for the, for the laptops, uh, I will ask for a motion. I'll make the motion that we approve the superintendent's recommendation for the one-to-one -one laptops. Second. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion, Mr. Floyd. Excuse me. Motion, Mr. Murphy. Second, Mr. Floyd. Okay. Yes, Dr. Kelly. Yes, sir. I, um, I also asked in the motion or the recommended motion that you delegate, as you do with some other transactions, right? Uh, remaining purchasing authority to me, so that I can move with George Annie and others more quickly. Mr. Murphy, do you mind reading the motion as written and just restating it? And uh, if Mr. Floyd, if you wouldn't mind uh, redoing your second. Hang on, Charles. Let me, I'm getting to it. Okay. Page 69. Page 69. Murph. All right, hang on one second here. I'm on the TASB delegation. Hold on. <laughs> No, I mean I'm on the I'm on the the iPad and the and the phone, so Ah, okay. Okay. All right, man. Just will you delegate me to read it for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm I can I can do it, Charles. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I make a motion that the board approves administration's plan and purchase slash lease of devices as recommended and that the board delegates purchasing authority for these transactions to the superintendent with reports to the board thereafter. All right. Motion, Mr. Berry. Second, Mr. Mr. Floyd. Second, Mr. Floyd. Uh, Sean, just for, just for the sake of completion, would you withdraw your earlier motion? Okay, I'll withdraw my previous uh, motion. Thank you. That's, 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 uh, I think we're in good shape. Okay. Uh, motion Barry, second Floyd. Uh, is there any further discussion? 
All right, hearing none, we will vote. Trustee Decker, you lead off. Aye. Trustee Carbone. Aye. Trustee Barry. Aye. Trustee Murphy. Aye. Trustee Gooden votes aye. Trustee Floyd. Aye. Trustee Bakken. Aye. All right, motion carries 7 0. Thank you, board. We think yeah. this is a fantastic. Big thanks for us as we go into the future. We are very, very thankful and happy for this. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you all very much for answering all those questions. That was uh, very enlightening. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. And you know, we know you got a lot of work left uh, to, to figure out. So we're, we're behind you. Thank you very much. Thank My you. birthday's in November. Thank you, Board. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. OK. All right, we will go back then to item three where we were talking about the consideration to approve the 2020-2021 budget and the discussion of the pros and cons for the tax rate election. Uh, may I ask uh, the members, uh, if you care, if you haven't already, to weigh in on your thoughts on uh, not specifically the amount of the TRE, but just the, the concept of the TRE in general? I've been actually in favor of it for the last two years. Um, I'm thinking that we are actually behind the, like as, as Dr. Kelly has pointed out, you know, other school districts did it, and I think we should have done it back then. So, um, and it's not for the sake of just spending money. I think that you know, oftentimes we're always, you know, scraping the barrel trying to and and doing what we do, which is great, but we can do so much more um, if we if we weren't always constrained, you know, held in these constraints. So. Um, and then with the new, bi the next biennium, we have no idea um, really what's going to happen as far as uh, the reduction in, in monies to to the district due to you know this pandemic and whatnot. So um, I think it's important that that we move forward with it. Thank you. The floor is open. Anyone else? Well, I, I, I mean, you know, I always have something to say about this, Charles. Sure. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to make it brief uh, in, in lieu of reiterating my previous statements. But, um, you know, given the compression, uh, the compression rate given to us with our last legislature, along with the uh, five golden pennies or uh, on the TRE associated with that, I think it's there's no better time now than the present to be able to show a minimum increase or or if any increase to the taxpayers when it comes to this TRE. So. From a taxpayer standpoint, I think it's our best opportunity to take advantage of this. I, I agree, and and if um, I, I think there's absolutely a way that uh, the importance of the TRE can be conveyed, so that the community understands it and comes behind behind it. And I'm, I'm assuming that this is the exact same as the bond election, where the district cannot persuade, where the district can inform. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, leave it to our capable uh, communications department to uh, to to develop the informational pieces. Uh, just just uh, real quick, if we are moving forward with this, this puts us on a schedule because if I'm not mistaken, this we have to approve this or vote to put it on the ballot by August. Am I correct? Yes, sir. I think uh, we have to announce in the paper August 7th by August 7th and then hold the actual vote to do it by, I don't know the date off the top of my head, but I think it's August 17th, something like that. Okay. Well, we're, we're all, we're on an August time frame for when we need to. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is for November ballot, correct? Yes, sir. And I would recommend yeah. that we would need to be probably in late July and just really get down to brass tacks before we publish that notice. Okay. In August. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any other, uh, Lance, um, Mr. Bakken? Um, so, um, oh, Ms. I know that I'm not Lance, but <laughs> so I think it's been no surprise for those kind of tuning into these meetings that I've been a strong supporter of the idea of a TRE um, since the beginning of this kind of budget workshop piece. Um, I think that when we look at the data, the, compre the rate that we had in fiscal year 1920 was at 93 cents. With House Bill 3, our um, projected pro compression rate is a tax rate of 85 cents. So that's leaving a variance of about almost seven and a half cents. And so when we take advantage of a golden penny that we can do at um, 
with the five cents that gives an additional state revenue of $2.5 million. And you guys stop me if I'm saying anything incorrectly here, but in my mind, the, the, paying, the only thing, I'm sorry, Ms. Carvalho yep. for interrupting. The only thing just to clarify for the audience is the 93 cents you're mentioning is a compressed rate portion of the MNO tax rate. Okay, in addition, we already have those four golden, golden pennies. So our current tax rate is 97 cents. Okay, so I guess what the picture I'm trying to paint is that the idea that our tax rate is being driven down and although appraisal rates have gone up, the tax rate that we're actually employing um, is driven down by about seven cents? About seven and a half cents uh, if we don't include that one extra golden penny. Right. So the one extra golden is, is something that we would approve unanimously that does not need to go out for a TRE. Um, and so in a, so that's the, so the taxpayer would be saving uh, six cents in our tax rate moving forward after that unanimous vote, assuming we all move forward. Um, and then we're also proposing later in this budget that we restructure debt. And after this year, our next year, the debt side, the INS side, is going to be going down by three and a half percent. Cents. Three and a half cents. What we're estimating, three and a half cents in okay. addition to. And so for us to maximize um, the income that we have from the state budget, the state supplements every penny that we, per, that we go out for and ask the taxpayers for up to eight cents. Like there's a substantial increase from state dollars. So right, then, they're called en enrichment dollars basically. Or the golden pennies that we've been referring to all night. They, they reward you for your effort in in adding those pennies okay so then we're going up if we potentially go up to the full eight cents then we'll be asking the taxpayers for three cents back of that compressed rate in addition to the three and a half cent decrease that they're going to see from our refunding of bonds next year yeah. they would still be saving this year um that's why it's a good year as well they would still be saving at the minimum about three and a half cents in addition to another three and a half cents that they would be saving next year because of the debt service portion of the rate. Okay. Um, is there, do you have any, and I know this is maybe too complex to just spout off, but maybe you just have it in your back pocket, but for every dollar that a tax taxpayer pays in, how many dollars does the state leverage that dollar um, for example, if I if I'm a taxpayer and I'm paying a dollar, then the state's going to contribute an additional how many dollars to complement that? So Georgiani, I mean, that's what, or, Georgiani, you think uh -huh. the best way to answer that because you've got it somewhere in here is for that 2.6 million. It's a it's a combination of, of increase in local revenue and an increase in state revenue. And maybe just look at that. What's that ratio? ratio? The local side is 886,000 more or less, and the state side is a million six thirty-eight. So it's basically for every dollar you get two dollars in state. Two dollars back. Okay. I think that that's a good picture for what we're asking for from our taxpayers. Is that um, we're asking them to go up by after next year a half a cent in their tax rate above the compressed rate. And then we get a two to one return, but I see Georgiani's face and I'm being too simplistic about it. Yes, because I, I just want to clarify that if we were to ask for four cents, the taxpayer will still see a reduction in their overall tax rate. Right. Because the minimum savings is about almost seven and a half cents. So the taxpayer will still see um, considering a seven and a half cents, assuming, right? And we go up four, they'll still see a three and a half savings in this year's tax bill. Right. And then they'll go down even further in that next year's tax bill. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you for helping me clarify. I'm no money master by any means, but I feel like there's a lot more people watching tonight than I've seen in the past. And I want to make sure that they understand that this is why it's important to do this now because of they won't we're not asking any more from them basically 
um, they're already going to be seeing a significant decrease in their tax rate. Um, and we're asking for a bit of that back to help leverage the state dollars. And it's not necessarily asking more for them. It's trying to maximize the use of the state funding that we get at that two to one ratio. Yeah, and, and I'd add to that, Crystal, something that you said a month ago or whenever it was, it was very compelling to me. And that is essentially this opportunity could be lost. I mean, uh, uh, we're going way down the tax rate and we have the opportunity to, to, to do this that may not be available at the next biennium or thereafter. So it's kind of like an opportunity lost if we were to not take advantage. Okay, so that's right. And, and we have to... We have to consider as well um, with the current budgets that we've been passing, um, we have been pulling major expense items that in prior years uh, we had, such as uh, buses, you know? Uh, it used to be that we used to have about $700,000 there in buses. Right now we're able to um, look at those uh, funds that we had set aside uh, that thankfully we got, you know, um, last year, but that doesn't, that's not there forever. So there's items that have not been included in the budget uh, that have, have we not had those funds right now, we would be needing to include. So in the future, we'll, we're going to be needing, needing to include those uh, items as well. So Mr. that's Moody, why it's important. I was going to say, uh, you and I know, Georgiani, that if Mr. Moody was to weigh in, he would talk about remaining competitive with salaries and health insurance. Right. That's always a struggle. Right. If if our enrollments can if our enrollment continues the way it has been for the last three years, where it's pretty stable, we're not going to see any new money coming in. So um, it's important, you know, to be able to have those funds to, uh, again, like Dr. Kelly said, for uh, the purpose of remaining competitive. And let me just add in my pipe dreams of lower to student to teacher ratio, block scheduling, and um, what was the other one? <laughs> but the, please note that those are there. Did, did you miss the part about the 10-year capital improvement plan? There you go. Thought I had to throw that in there, guys. I, I heard you, Jeff. You're muted, sir. Oh. You're muted. Trying to be all discreet because I got trains running in the background. I keep forgetting. That. Okay. Anyway, um, what I uh, what I let me remember what I said. The um, are, are there any other uh, comments or items uh, on on the TRE? Uh, we will I will put the budget back before the the board, and with the caveat that we um, approve the budget with the flexibility to uh, do a mid year supplemental. Uh, payment uh, pending. I guess we'll have to come up with some type of uh, criteria or metrics on that. Uh, anything else on the TRE? Well, Dr. Kelly, I think you have your uh, your guidance from the board on which way we're going to do that, and that puts us on uh, that puts us on a schedule where we need to be looking at August to you know make the required postings and uh, yes, posts. Okay. All right, um, on, the, on the budget, uh, which has been increased by $3.1 million uh, for next year. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was on mute, so sorry that I interrupt now. <laughs> um, but the other piece of this is uh, the conversation about the efficiency audit. Even though an, effic an efficiency audit, it's not required um, for this next two years because of COVID. Um, there, there was some interest in conducting one. So I just want to make sure that we um, touch base on that. Okay. What's the cost of an efficiency audit? It's, a, uh, we asked that question as part of our um, audit, um, RFP that we did. And it's a RFP, I'm sorry. And it's about, it's less than $10,000. And do you think it's going to yield enough valuable information that we can use, like, um, help educate our population based on the findings of that budget? 
or that efficiency audit? We're going to find ourselves. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say too much because I don't know the particulars of a financial audit, but by every means ever used since uh, in the last decade, we are one of the most efficient school districts in Texas. And so I, I'm, I'm not only not afraid of the audit, but I'm hoping that it does bolster in the eyes of voters that we're being as efficient as we possibly could be. And our current auditors are able to do it. Yeah, I looked at the audit plan that was released by the Legislative Budget Board, and it was a it was a lot of uh, comparisons, right? Uh, taking a lot of ratio, a lot of comparisons to see where you are versus other uh, other school districts. And um, yeah, I mean, it 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 can't hurt, you know. It, it certainly can't hurt. Um, yeah. Okay, so do we have, uh, I don't know that we need a, uh, a, a motion to, since we already have auditors in under contract, or that, yeah, do we need a, a motion? No, I mean, I can, that's the direction to go forward with that. Agree with me, I hear the board saying go for it, so we'll okay. do it. Any, any objection, members? Okay, all right, the efficiency audit will be a part of the, uh, part of the services for our auditor, okay. Mm -hmm. This is a part of where we're going to go moving forward, but I would love to have a visual to sort of um, put out in the community, sort of showing the pieces of where the decrease is happening from compression and that way they can see comparison from last year to this year and that the rate is starting that way. I mean, I feel like visuals are so powerful in that way. You guys have done a great job in the CAFR making those visuals happen. So um, I'm sure that's already a part oh. of it. I'll work with communications on that, as well as a very small, maybe video presentation of how it plays out. Love it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anything now outside of the budget? We've got all the ancillary items uh, squared away, so we just need to move to the budget now. Yes, Mr. President. I just want to remind uh, the board that I would recommend an additional motion just uh, to preserve your ability to make adjustments at mid-year, should you so choose, um, on, on supplement, pay supplement. You said a, se a separate motion for from well, the actual we're, budget? We're incorporating it in there, but basically what I'm saying is, you okay. know, some sort of a statement that gives you that flexibility. I mean like a, like a phrase on the end of the motion? Yes, I think so, that, you know, that the board reserves the right to readdress pay depending on the uh, condition of the fund balance at mid-year or something like that. Can I say so moved? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take I'm going to say that the board approves the fiscal 2021 <laughs> budget with Dr. Kelly's additions. Uh, would, would you would you say the additions? Oh, I guess I guess you said say so moved. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, uh, we're, we're clear on what that means, right? Yes. Everyone's clear on what the motion is? Yes. Okay. Second. Okay, there was a motion, Carbone. Was that a second from Decker? It was. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Are there any further questions, any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, we'll vote. Trustee Floyd? Aye. And Trustee Carbone? Aye. Vodka? Aye. Gooden votes aye. Murphy? Aye. Barry? Aye. Decker? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Thank you all very much for your work on all of that. Okay. Now to item five consideration uh, to approve a bond order to refund outstanding bonds at a lower interest rate. Uh, Mr. President, may I interject something here? Yes, sir. Um, there's a, a fairly detailed group of people ready to make the report on the um, on the uh, widening of elective waivers. So if right, I, yeah, I do have all my high school principals here. Okay, all right. Let's. Um, so your your recommendation is to go take that report and then come back to the bonds. Come back to the bonds. Okay. All right. Uh, any objection from the board? Fair enough. We will move to and all the high school principals just jump back on. Here's everybody. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, that is item A, uh, the request to consider the widening of elective waivers 
available for incoming high school students in 2020 and 2021 and thereafter. Um, okay, good right. evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Margot Giggy. I know we have a lot of visitors tonight, so just to clarify, if I haven't met you yet, I am Margot Giggy, and I'm the Director of Advanced Academics, and um, I have lots of good ideas, but they're not really my own ideas, and most of they came from students. And for some reason, students never hesitate to ask to tell me what they think I should do or the district should do to make school better for them. And a few years ago, I had a group of students tell me that they thought a GPA waiver or a pass-fail type of a, a situation would not only make them um, more well-rounded, but it would reduce stress. And they thought if they could simply have a class during the day that brought them joy and that life would just be infinitely better. So uh, after some research, we uh, instituted our GPA waiver uh, program as we see it now. And um, so again, started in the fall of 2013 with um, just a few classes, and Ms. Holt will tell you more about that later. But some of the other ideas that our kids have had have included adding additional classes like AP Comparative Government, our research class, and uh, our explorer's trip, an additional math class beyond Calculus BC. And um, so, They've got, and they, we listen to them and they see, they, they really have good ideas. And so that's, I wanted you to know, first of all, that that's where this whole idea of a GPA waiver came from. It didn't start from parents or from administrators or my office, it came from the kids. And uh, they've been um, very clear about that. So um, SAT prep class was one class that was added later uh, after our initial classes with uh, choir and band and color guard and some of those very time intensive courses. And uh, then we expanded it to SAT prep because 11th grade seems to be the toughest year. If you've had a senior in high school or um, a recent graduate, they will tell you 11th grade seems to be the academically toughest year they have. And so SAT prep class is uh, another GPA waiver and it's a no homework class. So um, that was another good thing uh, that the kids uh, had. Their feedback has been very positive that they like that. We're seeing more and more kids participate as the years have progressed with this. And I'd like to introduce some of our experts. Uh, we have our high school principals here, some lead counselors, and they've done some research. Uh, Mrs. Weimer has had up, headed up that effort and she's got some information from other districts as well. So I think Kelly Holt is next and she can tell you a little bit about the history and uh, the impact on campus. There you go. <laughs> I'm Kelly Holt, the principal at Dawson High School, and I think our district has done a phenomenal job of trying to um, relieve stress students along with address their mental health issues. And so I just want to talk about a few things we've done. Uh, the way definitely one of those originally was given to classes that for classes that have extensive time spent after school, like band, athletics, color guard. Um, things like that, things where the kids spent hours after school uh, and we felt that that deserved a waiver. And then um, in the, with the class of 2018-19, we increased the waivers to over 90. So now a, a freshman or any student since a freshman of 2018-19 can take any class that's on our list of 90 plus classes and if that class is a 4.0 or a 5.0 class and it impacts their GPA negatively, and they can waive that, uh, that class and it would not impact their GPA. Now there is, it is true they have to make an A, but most of these students are A students and that is not an issue for them uh, achieving that. The classes range now, uh, instead of just athletics and band and color guard, we now include art, PE, um, many of all of our theater courses, uh, almost all of our CTE, CTE courses, unless they're double blocked, are included, along with dance uh, and yearbook, which was a big one because many of our students could not take yearbook uh, because it was a 4.0 class and it's a four-year class and they just didn't feel they could put it in their schedule with their GPA. And so we have seen an increase since uh, 2017 from 2018. We saw an increase at Dawson High School of the number of waivers that have been submitted. Um, and so that's just one way. 
There are other courses that we've put into place and options to try to release stress for students. Uh, Ms. Giggy mentioned the um, advanced uh, SAT prep class, which is a junior level class, and it does allow a student to have a fifth waiver, so they can have one every year. And then when they take SAT prep, they can also waive that if it impacts negatively on their GPA. Um, seniors can have an off period if they're on target to graduate. And seniors can also either be an office assistant, they can work with our life skills unit and, and, and work in that unit, or they can be a lab assistant in the science, uh, science department. So there's many ways that seniors can have even two classes that do not average into their GPA. The uh, lab assistant and the uh, office aide are both local credit classes and do not impact GPA. And many of our seniors take advantage of all of those. Um, we also have increased summer school original credit. We now offer art. Matter of fact, we have, we, I believe we have 52 students taking art this summer for original credit. It is virtual this summer for the first time, but they're taking advantage of that so that that doesn't impact their GPA. Along with PE, we have over 50 kids in PE this summer, uh, geometry and several others. And then of course, we still offer credit by exam where students can take a credit by exam through either UT or Texas Tech and they can opt out of taking that class during the school year um, and replace it with another class they prefer. So those are the options that we've done uh, course-wise, but then we've done many other things on campus. And I think one of the biggest things, uh, and if you've had a student go through or spoken to a parent, I know my Eagles are this way, is Eagle Hour and Euler Hour is a big stress reliever. It's one hour during the school day. I know, I'm not sure about COVID, but before COVID, where students were allowed to just go to tutorials, sit and work on their homework. Um, if they didn't want to do that, they could just relax and take a break from the stress of school all day um, and sit with their friends. And our kids love it at Dawson and they love the, um, the hour they have. I will see kids sitting around studying in, in groups and, um, and I'll see some just, just, like I said, relaxing, but that's a good stress reliever for school. The RISE mentor program has really taken off at the high school. We not only have community members, but we also have staff members who have been through the RISE mentoring training along with my assistant principals, and they are uh, sponsoring kids on campus. And then I think the counselors have done a great job at having parent meetings and trying to inform parents about what colleges are actually looking for. You know, I think most parents come in and think colleges are only looking for the top number one, the top number two. But the counselors have had meetings and they inform uh, parents about how AP classes are actually accepted at state supported schools or public schools versus Ivy League schools versus community college. And um, that, that has impacted hopefully uh, the choices and the number of AP classes that students are taking. And hopefully they're listening to their counselors and they're taking not only those classes that challenge them, but also the classes that, that bring them joy during the day, even if it's you know, a not a, a 5.0 or 6.0 class and then using that waiver. Um, also, there are some of our courses that are quote, no homework and the kids can tell you which ones those are. That's the advanced SAT prep class, our, our capstone research and seminar class. And we just put in a new class this year at Dawson. Um, uh, it's PAP linear, I'm gonna make sure I don't say this wrong, algebra and multivariable calculus. And uh, it's for the students who have basically run out of math classes. They have taken so many or they're so advanced. And so that class is also gonna be on that list. So it's, it's a, a, a good math for them. And I believe the most important step we've made is the hiring of our student support counselors at the high school level. It has changed uh, the amount of stress that, that kids have and our, our way to actually help them relieve that stress, someone to talk to, someone to build that relationship with. And uh, mine is Ms. Frazier and she's amazing. And so that's what we've done at the high school to try to relieve stress, um, all suggestions. So anything else you have that you think would help us out, anything to make these kids enjoy high school and um, not, not, be for, not have the stress put on them every day, we're, we're up for it, so let us know. I think next Ms. Weimer will share some information regarding um, our current waiver policy and how this um, sets up against other surrounding districts uh, and what their waiver policy is. Ms. Weimer? Thank you, Kelly. The first thing I wanted to go over is a little bit of data. So along with what Ms. Holt said with widening the electives and hitting a lot of interest of kids, which is really great. I mean, we have anything from livestock production to floral design to fashion design, so all those different areas. So with that, since we added in 2018, you look at the data, 
So in the last two years, both of the traditional schools, uh, Paraline High School, Dawson High School, we have 90 waivers that are granted within that realm of those extra electives. And with Turner, he has 27, but that's triple the number he had in 18, because remember, they don't have UIL courses where they have the competition and stuff. We have some kids that actually are bused over to the other schools. So it was kind of really cool to see the kids at 27 even and taking advantage of some of the things they're interested in. Uh, Margo mentioned the SAT that was in 2015. It's for um, 10th through 12th grade. So the impact there, again, very positive. So we have basically 60 students in the last two years on an average at Pearland High School that has taken advantage of that waiver. And then we have 135 students at Dawson High School that has taken that SAT, the advanced SAT prep. So it's beneficial too because it helps, of course, for college entrance and stuff and preparation. Uh, Turner doesn't have uh, very many there because those kiddos get the, you get the opportunity of the five points or the waiver. So Mr. Bouchard has informed me they're taking advantage of the five points on that. So uh, with that. So in looking, just a recap, for total waivers, last two years, Pearland High School has 458 average on total waivers. Dawson High School, 642. And then you have uh, Turner has doubled the numbers with a 47 total. So again, they're taking advantage of it. I think it's a, a great thing that they can explore the wide variety. Ms. Hocott, do you mind putting up my comparison with the other districts, please? Then we took a look at what are other districts doing. So I thought I would share that with you as well. Thank you. So I'm looking at some other districts. First of all, I want to share that we lead with uh, four, one a year, and then the SAT advanced SAT prep as well. Alvin is starting in 2023, basically with the classes that we started with in 2013, but they're giving two a year, junior, senior year only. Again, it's the advanced extracurricular courses that have the most participation, a lot of competition, a lot of after school hours. So you can see the list there. When we contacted Creek, they're not doing any GPA exemptions. They haven't, and they're not in any discussion about it. So Conroe has two, one junior year, one senior year. But again, it's the third and fourth grade, uh, I'm sorry, third and fourth level classes of an extracurricular course. Fort Bend, again, third and fourth year of an extracurricular class. And Katie, a little bit different. It has uh, three waivers total that you can get. They are still the extracurricular courses and the second, third, or fourth year in the same program. So basically you have to make the team in these or you have to be in the class at least one year prior and it feeds into, let's say band, then you can continue with the two, three, four. So I still feel like, you know, I, I'm just very proud of what Pearland committees have looked at and adding this for kids. So then we take a look at, if we were gonna expand it even more, what would we look at? What could we do and what kind of student impact would it have? So Mr. Palumbo has some information on that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weimer. Uh, when we started this conversation, just kind of exploring, you know, what, what would it look like if we expanded, you know, what, what, what would that impact be? And so I, I wanted to take a little bit of a look at our current graduating class that we just had and the impact of, you know, the GPA, if we added an additional um, GPA waiver in there. So Ms. Hocott, if you can uh, pull the, data for that it was pretty interesting to um, see what what actually happens um, when, when you look at it on the left I'll kind of go through the two charts a little bit um, to kind of give you some information uh, and I thought it was important sorry my energy saver light just turned out on me so if you can't see me give me one second um, so uh, when you look at the chart on the left I, I thought it was important to start out with the ninth grade year um, because there's not a whole lot of movement typically in our GPA rank. There's a little bit, but for the most part, um, you know, they, they start out pretty much and they kind of track along where they're supposed to track along. The second column in that first chart is the uh, at the third nine weeks. That's when uh, we kind of pulled this data uh, because there's starting to be some discussions about looking at other options. 
And then the last column is the final, where you can see at the final rank, there wasn't a whole lot of change in the rank. There was a little bit of movement, but not a ton with regards to that. In the second column, uh, I mean, the second chart, what you're looking at there is, is that there, the first column is their rank that they had in the second column on the left chart, uh, where it says rank. So those two match. Um, so, for example, the first kid that you're looking at, their rank was number one, their rank was number one in the chart number two, and then their new rank would have been number one. Um, and then following that, um, in the second chart, the second kid was ranked number four in the previous chart to just kind of follow along. And so in the second chart, what we looked at was giving an additional waiver to another four-point class. Uh, and what you can see now happening is, is that the GPAs are really compressing. Um, and our anticipation would be is this may add more uh, stress to students um, just because of the fact that we all know that our students are very competitive academically and they talk a lot and most of these kids are friends. They're talking to each other. And so now there's a dialogue about, okay, well, you made a 97. Now I got to make a 98, 99 on the test if I want to get above you or if I want to make Val or Sal. Uh, you can see that the, the ranking is very close uh, with regards to the top four on the right. Uh, and that movement can happen, and we see that pretty frequently uh, with our kids uh, throughout the year. Those uh, Usually it's only the first two um, throughout the four years in high school that kind of go back and forth. Um, but that, that kind of compresses the rest of the GPA rank when you look at the rest of the chart as well. Everything else comes up. Uh, and then so you got kids that are starting to battle to get into, uh, you know, the number 10 spot, who wants to be in top 10. You can see how close 11 and 12 and even 13 are. Uh, and even 14. And so our fear is, is that if we went down this road and we added an additional waiver, we may end up adding more stress to our kids because they start lining out where they're going to be at and they're going to be more competitive. And now, you know, when we want our kids to master the material and if you make a 95 on one test and a 96 on the next test, maybe an 88, that's okay, we want you to have that flexibility versus, well, I made an 88, I need to try to make a 90 or a 95 to move up. And so there's just some fears that we, we may create more of a problem by adding an additional waiver each year um, with regards to that, because it, there's a pretty big compaction uh, with that. And when I look at the uh, GPAs just on my top 50, you know, most of our kids um, are taking a pretty well-rounded approach. Uh, we've got our competitive kids that choose to, uh, you know, academically they're competitive and they want to either be top 10 or balance out. But those breaks are pretty uh, substantial when you look at the first chart uh, with regards to their GPAs. Those breaks start to come come pretty uh, pretty frequently with regards to that. Um, I'll have Corey Spruce jump in a little bit too because she's uh, got some insight on you know high ranking kids and then also uh, college admissions um, that we discussed in the process as well. One thing to just kind of tag on to what Mr. Palumbo said was. Um, you know, as we start to add in a GPA waiver, um, we're going to get closer and closer, especially in the junior year of essentially doing a core GPA. So if a student has two GPA waivers in their junior year, in addition to SAT prep, we're now looking at a core GPA system versus just having, you know, one waiver, you know, where they're still having six classes. Um, so that's just something I, you know, just wanted to kind of tap in there. Um, for those of you on, on the Zoom tonight that don't know me, I am Corey Spruce and I'm the lead counselor at Dawson High School. And um, as everybody, everybody knows, the end game of GPA is the impact on college admissions. So that's kind of my focus area tonight. Um, for those of us that have been out of the college admissions game, for quite some time, the process and the requirements are constantly changing. Um, consistently, I have parents that ask me for that magic formula on how to get their student into a, their particular college um, that they want to attend. And as much as I would love to have that magic wand or that magic formula, the truth of the matter is it's constantly changing. And I think, you know, what we're seeing right now during COVID, we um, are seeing that landscape change even more. Um, there is not a one size fits all approach for any of the colleges and or any student across the nation. So the current trend that we're seeing is that a lot of colleges, is, uh, colleges are starting to move away from rank GPA and test scores as being the sole representation of a student. Um, like I mentioned, I'm looking forward to seeing the impact of COVID on the admissions cycle. 
um, because we're starting to see more of the schools go test optional or just say we're not requiring tests at all, including most recently as um, today when University of Texas, which I thought was going to be the standout, you know, that they would hold off on that decision. They actually made the decision today that they're not going to require a test score next year. But in terms of GPA, universities are starting to convert a student's GPA to this a university's own standardized scale or simply converting it to a, weight, a unweighted GPA of a flat 4.0 scale. So for example, I just picked out a couple colleges to mention. Um, Louisiana State calculates a student's GPA on a flat 4.0 scale. They convert everything and A goes to a four, a B goes to a three, et cetera. On a no tigers. Courses. I'm sorry? Okay. So go Tigers. Is showing his LSU pride. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I did not know that, so that was not planned. <laughs> um, but the state of Louisiana has their set of four courses that are required for graduation. So that's what LSU um, looks at when they look at terms of GPA. They calculate those um, 16 core credits. Um, and don't consider anything else the student is taking. They do look at the weight, they do take that into consideration of whether a student has taken an AP course, um, but they calculate the GPA on their own scale. Um, a little bit closer to home, Sam Houston State, this has been one of the biggest changes in the last couple of years in the state of Texas. They still grant automatic admissions to the top 10%, but for the general admissions, they now recalculate everything on a 4.0 scale. They want to know what the student's GPA is on a 4.0 and then align that to an SAT and ACT score. So over the last couple of years, we've actually, I've made a lot of kids days at Dawson when they think that they're not going to go to a four-year school and they're going to, you know, start off at a two-year junior college because they don't think they can get into a four-year school. And then, and then I say, hey, let's look at Sam Houston State. You have a 3.5 on a 4.0 scale. Here's the SAT score that you have to have. You already have that. You could walk into Sam Houston State today. So we're just, we're starting to see, you know, colleges start to rethink the GPA idea um, and one thing we have to remember is that Pearland ISD is just one of thousands of districts across the country that sends school, students to universities, and they all have vastly different GPA skills. You know, just in the Region 4 area, we see that. And so the colleges have to have a way to level that playing field. Um, just to talk a little bit more about college admissions, um, I think it's important um, it's something I know, you know, it's part of my daily talk, but I don't think everybody realizes the things that colleges ask counselors and teachers to give insight on when they're looking at college admissions. So when you look at um, the common application, which is the application system that students use for private universities and actually an increasing number of in-state colleges, schools such as Rice, Stanford, the Ivy Leagues, um, they're starting to put more emphasis on the non-academic expectations. They're looking at leadership. They're looking at service. They want to see that the student has a passionate interest in some aspect of the world. And so kind of to expand on that, um, you know, if a kid is interested in politics but is spending all of their time at, you know, at a medical research lab, that may not be a good fit. And the colleges are looking at, do, does a student's extracurriculars match their passion? Um, colleges look to the recommendation letters from teachers and counselors to provide insight into a student. So they ask the counselors to address academic achievements, if there's been any gaps, um, the student's personal interests, their goals. They want teachers to provide a view of the applicant's intellectual curiosity, their creative thought and work habits. And then from outside recommenders, they want to see um, what an, an applicant's interest and pursuits are outside of school. They are the ones that can show how an applicant works in teams, how they distribute or contribute to their community. 
and then what hobbies and um, creativity outside of school that they have. Um, one example I wanted to give you, I had a student, um, I believe he graduated in 2011. He was in our second or third graduating class from Dawson. And um, he was one of my personal students and he was accepted early decision to Stanford as a computer science major, which is a huge feat at Dawson, um, it, at Stanford, but it's very hard for our Caroland ISD students to get into Stanford. We've sent them to Rice, we've sent them to Yale, but for some reason, Stanford's kind of the, the holdout on us. And so I was at an admissions update and the admissions officer was describing this student to me and, or to the, our group. And I was like, I know this kid. I wrote that kid's letter of recommendation. And I went up and I spoke to her and I said, I need to know what was it? We have such a hard time getting kids into Stanford. What was it about this student? And she said, his key factor, so this is the one thing I always talk to students about, is what is your key factor? What is that thing that is gonna make you stand out from everybody else? She said was his intense and obvious passion for computer science. She didn't mention test score, she didn't mention the GPA. Um, she said he was a member of numerous clubs as the technology guru, or he was the webmaster. When he was in fifth grade, he had created a reading program um, to help his younger sister learn to read. And then he, his family distributed that out into their community and um, sold this computer program to these other families in, the, in our area to teach other kids how to read. And then during the summer, he completely redesigned the data entry program at one of the research labs at the, one of the local hospitals. And so she, at the end of all of this, she said, it was the evidence of his passion. That's what got him into Stanford was his passion. So, um, you know, as counselors, you know, <laughs> these are our success stories. And, you know, we strive to guide the students and their parents on making the healthiest of choices for their kids when it comes to their um, course selection. And we have two goals in mind when it comes to academics. Number one, we want them to graduate and we want them to be prepared in their second post-secondary education or in the workforce and as they enter high school we try to drive home the point that each family should make decisions that are right for their own child and not to match the path of their older sibling or their neighbor or their cousin's friend um, we encourage them to monitor their student and if a class load is too stressful we recommend that they scale back but we want to make sure that all of our kids are challenged and that they truly follow their passions both inside and outside of the classroom and are prepared for their future. And so with that, I'm going to throw it back to Ms. Giggy to wrap it up. Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, I had that same student and he was quite remarkable. But again, his passion showed it, and rather than a smorgasbord of a little bit of this and a little bit of that, he really focused uh, all of his interest and his passion in that one area of computer science. So um, as we wrap this up, I want to say in conclusion that you know, the goal of the GPA waiver was to reduce student stress and to give students an opportunity to find that joy um, in learning sometime throughout the school day. And based on the research by everyone here and the research we did outside of the of our school district and the feedback we've had from students and from parents. We feel that we really have the best um, program right now for our students and to add another GPA waiver would probably have the opposite impact of increasing the student stress as it, that GPA is compacted and even now with the, with, with the one GPA waiver we have students whose um, position and or class rank is you know, three thousands of a point, I think that's over at Turner, or going into next year, it's three thousands of a point uh, separating those students. And um, that increases the stress. So we really would recommend that we keep the one GPA waiver. Uh, there are so many options for students. And I think the one better or differently is to actually encourage kids to take advantage of that GPA waiver and everything that's available. We have seen that increase every year, but I think uh, there are more kids who could do that. 
So um, we'll continue to monitor that and listen to our students. And um, thank you for your time. So, Dr. Thank Kelly, are we? Oh, sorry, Charles. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead, sir. I'm. I'm wondering. I guess as we're talking about this, is this just? Is this a? This is an administrative report and update because I thought we had already approved to do the GPA waivers previously. You're muted, Doc. You're muted, Dr. Kelly. Oh. Um, uh, we had we had uh, requests from trustees going back. I don't remember the whole history of this, but to examine, I think as as old as a year or more, to examine whether we ought to expand it beyond one to two. And so, as uh, Charles uh, and I, mostly Charles, planned out the board calendar, this is where it fell. And so we, we didn't want to neglect it because if there was a decision to be made on it, it needed to be made during the summer before the incoming freshman came in. So. Um, you know, I, I guess at this point, after hearing all this, uh, uh, you know, our recommendation at this point is not to add a, an additional uh, second pass-fail uh, opportunity per uh, per grade level. Um, I I, I, um, I was one of the uh, I was one of the trustees that asked about it. Um, and I think the most compelling information that you you presented was the uh, was the charts, uh, Mr. Plumbo, um, and seeing how the, you know the compression rate and all that kind of stuff because it would cause. <laughs> I, I've lived the, the GPA game, so um, yeah, I know I know it's real, and I, that would if it's gonna it would be the reverse effect of what people are asking like if we're going to give them to they're thinking it's going to be different but if, if by seeing that information uh that's pretty compelling <laughs> yeah, i don't want to you know to undo what we already did you know what we gave them by giving the one waiver so um and i think that there's other mental health and student health um initiatives that we can really work on to to help with um easing the stress and, and coping with all of the um the teenage years kind of things that they they deal with especially you know um when we come back uh this fall but i think it's going to be interesting so i do appreciate you guys looking into this and um you know i i, I it was i had other people asking about it so the information is uh well received i appreciate it my pleasure uh, trustees the floor is open yes sir yeah, I, I also asked uh i think alongside the other trustees to look into this because we've heard for quite a while now um, uh, from parents, not just well, and students, but but also parents talking about you know maybe we move to where there's a 5.0 class instead of uh, or, or you know like an honors mid tier um, and, and and you know expanding that um, or you know capping the number of AP tests that can actually uh, AP uh, classes that can cal be calculated into your GPA right that 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 was I think Arwen Jackson brought that up a couple meetings ago. Um, you know, I guess my question is, one, it does the um, additional waiver, right, if we went that route, which, you know, I, I hear what the administration is saying, but does the, the effect of that, which is having in another course you could pass fail, uh, does that offset the increased stress level that you might have among the top 25, you know, and, and then how are the other students being impacted by this that are not in the top 25? Does uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. I've got a few. I've got a few thoughts on that. Um, you know, I think number one, where we, what we would see is in the top twenty-five, it's not going to change very much because there there are high achieving kids and they're wanting to take the advanced placement courses because they, they want to try to get college credit in addition to that. So I don't see them reducing the number of six-point classes. Um, the other thing that we didn't explore too deeply, but I, I have some fear of as well, is, is that we would only be calculating possibly 15, 16 courses in a kid's high school career in their GPA um, because of the fact that you've got SAT prep in your junior year. You've got uh, also, in addition to that, you've got student aid and also off period in their senior year. And so those are three courses that would not count in there that would come out as well that are additional to another, two, another uh, one each year. 
Um, and so I think the compaction, once the kids figure out the game, would actually get closer than it actually is right now because they just don't understand the game right now uh, if they had new rules. Um, the other side of it is, is this, you know, the other kids with regards to their stress, you know, I, I've been watching districts around us and something we probably should maybe consider uh, is looking at getting, getting away from ranking kids outside of the top 10% because that's required by the, the state. Uh, and they're going towards more of a quartile system. You know, you're just in a quartile because mainly what colleges look, by, look at after the top 10% is what quartile are you in? And they set a SAT or ACT score that you've got to make according to the quartile that you've got to get in. And so that may be something we want to explore for our kids that are on our high achieving GPA chasing uh, students that we have on our campus. Um, and I think that would relieve some stress because then we're just talking about quartiles and saying, look at your quartile and here's a chart of, court, uh, of scores that you may need to make in our top, kid, our top universities that most of our kids go to. And I think that'll help give some guidance. Um, I think that would be something that I would maybe make a suggestion for um, with regards to that um, to help those kids out. I'd like to piggyback on that and maybe reframe Michael's question a little bit. And I don't know if, I don't want to speak for you, but I guess what I hope to get out of this report and what I saw kind of coming on our um, board calendar was a, a way to address student stress um, and to see an exploration of different ways and what the impact would be if we explored different ideas. And I think um, a GPA waiver is a worthy discussion and it doesn't sound like that's something that necessarily the group feels like we need to pursue. And given the data that you guys have presented, it's a compelling argument. And I would tend to agree that the waiver is not the answer. And yet the stress level that's being reported from teachers and students at, the, at our high schools, and even lower for that matter, but specifically at our high schools um, remains. And so I'd like to throw out a few ideas for consideration, um, including, collapsing the GPA scale and what is the true benefit of doing the 6.0 scale versus a 4.0 weighted scale with the AP classes. Um, the class rank and doing something different and looking at just what Mr. Palumbo was saying at just looking at the 10% and then going a little bit further and when are we reporting these class ranks and how frequently are we reporting them to kids and giving them the insight on where they are ranking. Um, and then it seems to me like the idea that we're using the high performers to drive the education. Oh, oh one more, um, limiting the number of AP courses. I think that's worth um, talking about and pursuing as well. Um, that if we, if we cap the number of AP courses that you can take, then it kind of forces you into the idea that you have to be well-rounded and explore other options um, outside of AP level rigor. Um, I th think there's a great benefit to our district when we add AP numbers um, for our accolades and the way that we can show that we have very high performing students that are able to, to achieve all kinds of things. And yet I'm not really sure what the benefit is to the individual student. Um, and continuing down that path, kind of looking at those top 25 kids are pulling up so high that those median level kids, I think there's kids that want to try really hard and end up being putting themselves in an AP level rigor that they can't really perform at that level. And yet they're choosing to be in that class because they don't want to be with the 80 percenter kind of things. And we've talked a lot about this in the past and I don't know what the mechanism is to have a mid-level tier that they can participate in or um, because it seems like from the outside looking in that we teach to the highest kid in an AP class, but we're teaching to the lowest kid in a general education class to ensure that they get the benefit of the education and pulled up. And so that mid-level kid gets sort of lost in the shuffle um, and they don't, they don't quite fit up here, but they don't quite fit down here. And then how, what's their stress level impact? Um, because, well, because of everything I just said. Um, so that's some of my thoughts for what they're worth and what I'd like to see us kind of explore a little bit further um, in attempting to answer kind of where we are with the stress level with our high school students and kind of, can we vet some of these options? 
right, yeah, the um, what Mr. Palumbo mentioned about ranking is uh, something that obviously we've seen other people do, and and it's this. It just seems to be that there are we by definition when we talk about student stress. I mean, there are you know the student support counselors hit. You know, they they take care of the entire student population, right? But when we're talking about this academic stress, that seems to be. Uh, it's just a characteristic of those who are at the higher end, right? That are trying to take, you know, as many GPA, I mean, as many AP courses as they can take. And the other thing that I, I've heard about that causes, you know, that maybe that undue stress is that we, you know, the top 10 ranking, right? And, um, but I guess if you, if you're going to do the top 10%, you'll obviously by definition still have, you know, that first top 10. And that can always be something I guess does that have to be something that we that we uh, that we celebrate, right? Can you just not be in? Can you just be in the top ten percent? And you know, outside of that, we just leave it alone. Um, and Crystal also mentioned about the um, kind of the middle kid and uh, not really having an option between the AP and the regular because they're just not challenged in regular. Uh, I think that's something that's come up uh, several times. Uh, but I really like the idea of discussing and uh, exploring uh, not doing the ranking outside of the top 10% that's required. Uh, but uh, other than that, I appreciate the insight and the analysis on that, on the GPA waiver. Uh, because when we did the one uh, about a year or so ago, I remember, you know, 2018, it's two years ago now, I remember, you know, several of us were like, well, wait a minute, why not do two, right? Because we were trying to you know, do the very most, right, that we could do to give kids other options to kind of, you know, decompress. Uh, but it seems like, like you said, that would take it take it back the other way. And I'm, I'm really interested if there are any other recommendations mm -hmm. uh, on other things that we can do, right, that, that might be um, helpful. And one of the things we've, we hear about maybe every two years is that there's some teachers that give too much work right and then we have to go out and you know, there's there's some you know i guess um collab not collaboration but uh you know you kind of bring that back in the tech and you know then you know in two years you know we start hearing the, the complaints again uh is there any thought about you know if not equalizing the amount of work uh in just kind of right sizing the work to get what we need um is there any thoughts about that and and just anything else well, I, I can see this too with the with the work side. You know, Miss Gigi and her team does a good job of monitoring that and reaching out to us, and we do a, we try to do that as well. Um, you know, the challenge becomes when a kid chooses to take six and seven courses, and it's not a whole lot of kids, but when they choose mm -hmm. to take six and seven advanced courses, you're taking six or seven college hour courses, which ends up being eighteen, twenty four hours of college credit, and so that becomes a that's a parent student you know kind of discussion and you know i'll share this too you know i had a conversation with some of our uh high ranking kids recently too just asking them where does the pressure come from you know because i wanted to make sure it wasn't us it wasn't our campus pushing that and they said no it's absolutely not it's not you and i said well where is it coming from and i said is it even coming from your parents and a lot of them say no it's just them so i think the kids there's just the culture of you've got a pocket of kids that want to be in the top 10 or want to be valence style and i don't think it matters really what game you know what what rules we put out there they're going to work it to figure out who's where that's just the nature and they're typically all friends you know they know each other they've known each other for years um you know, and so they know each other they're going to talk about it they're going to be talking about their grades they're going to be comparing so even if we only go to a four point scale we're going to have to find a way to name a valid valedictorian right because we're going to have to have some kind of rule and parameters the state says you have to name a valedictorian so they're going to come up with a way to find out who's where in that, in that situation. And I, I don't know that there's a perfect answer. Um, I, I definitely want to I, I agree with you. I think we still need to continue to explore, but you know, I, I don't know that, that if we change some of the rules that it's going to fix the problem with some of our top tier kids, you know, cause they're just, that's, they're driven. That's what they, that's what they want. Yeah, I and I remember, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Why, go ahead. Why do we even do, why do we even rank Wait them at this point? Uh, GPA and uh, well, not GPA valedictorian. We have to name a valedictorian, and the state says That's we have to. That's a senior year. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, that's your senior year. Why not just rank them in your senior year towards the end instead of carrying on all this ranking and all this profiling and all this competition amongst each other? I'll, I'll promise you this, Mr. Barry. They, they will be hand calculating. That's right. That will be happening. Okay, let them hand calculate, but they don't know what the rank is. <laughs> but they'll, they they'll be comparing. They all know who the top kid is. In the no, top. Jeff. Well, there you go. Know. Just don't do it. Well, and the short point I wanted to make was that some competition is actually good. We want our students to, to, to be engaged and actually involved. Not, not so much, but some is good. To the detriment. Not to the point, yeah, not to the point where it's a detriment, but, right? And I think that's, that's our biggest deal, right? Because we don't really talk about, uh, we don't really talk about this unless we're, well, that's, that's the wrong way to say it. Um, but we, we've actually looked at this, or I'm looking at this as at least partially a suicide prevention measure, right? Because that's, we've been worried about kids taking it to the very extreme, right? And um, I, I really appreciate what um, we, we, we've had to say about education as far as letting the parents know what is really going on uh, with, um, Ms. Bruce, what you were saying about what's really going on with the uh, college education or college admission uh, so that you're not, you're right-sizing your workload to get where you want to go, right? And not just under the thought that I got to take seven classes, uh, seven AP classes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge part for me to know that we're not um, pushing kids and we're trying to get kids into the right spot for them, for what their goals are. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's very comforting. So. Can I add one more piece to this? Because I feel like um, – that we don't have a quantifiable question that we're trying to answer. And it would be from an LSSP and me, we are all data driven and we want a report and we want a test and a data and a, a metrics at which to measure. This is the baseline. We implemented this measure and this happened. And so that in my mind, like it would even be helpful if we had a committee of students that are actually in various levels of our academic um, rigor and tell us what they think. Have parents come to the table and tell us what they think because at least then we have some kind of quantifiable, because I don't think we, if we, uh, we throw around this idea of student stress and academic stress all the time, but I don't even know that I really know what that means for those particular students. And maybe it's something that we don't fix. Maybe it's something that we educate more about. Um, maybe we don't need to change anything about our system, but until we are able to really quantify what's the problem, then it's really hard to throw solutions at it and expect that it's going to, to repair it. You know, we, Ms. Go ahead, sorry, sir. No, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, I, I was gonna say uh, to that end, um, we do have some quantifiable data. You know, so if the concern is mental health, and, and the concern is what is causing stress to our students um, on our campus. And I'm pretty sure it's the same on, on all high school campuses. When the counselors come in, they take that data and, and record that data as to uh, here are the students that came to visit with me today. And here were the kinds of things that they were stressed out about. Mm -hmm. And so we do have some data there. And, and I, I think it would be wrong to suggest that all of the students that have these stressors and all of these students that have uh, mental health concerns are all tied to GPA. I think right. only a portion of that is GPA. Another right. portion might be, uh, you know, uh, family problems or uh, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend kind of a situation. But our counselors do collect that data. And, um, and that's something that could be done going forward just to kind of get some of the quantifiable data that you're looking at. Yes, and we've seen some of that come across from Mrs. Moore whenever she um, presents to us. We get kind of a number of how many visits are happening and how they're broken down. Um, but I think the difference of what I'm hearing, what the, the misstep between that report and what parents in the community continue to report to us is kind of when we're out talking to the community as board members and that kind of thing is they don't, the level of stress that their parent, their students are feeling because of the academic rigor. Um, and I don't know if that's a student driven thing, a parent driven thing. And I think at the start of this waiver discussion, correct me if I'm wrong from other board members, but I feel like it was about how do we address 
student stress, like academic stress. Um, that's a little bit different from the mental health needs because I don't, I think it's a suicide prevention measure, but at the same time, we don't see our high achieving students having a problem with suicidal ideation. We see our high achieving students complaining of depression and anxiety. And so I think that's a different measure altogether than those students that have all that others. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes sense to me. And, and you know, and so when we, I guess when we take this a, a step further and one of the other things was we didn't want the GPA race to sort of prevent a kid from doing fill in the blank activity or take him fill in mm -hmm. the blank class. Uh, but if they, if they go ahead and do it, right, and then they end up, it negatively impacts their GPA, then that's just, is, that's just something we're willing to live with. Uh, and and uh, in, in saying that, well, yeah, you know, if you, if you go ahead and decide to pursue this, you'll, you, you'll have a lower GPA as opposed to if you hadn't, right, just by not ex expanding this to two. We're, we're willing to live with, with that just overall. Now, uh, Charles and, and, and Crystal, you both hit on something that we're really, we, we've tried to improve and we're not where we want to be yet. And Corey and Annalisa Coates, the other lead counselor, I think in the audience, uh, what we've tried to do is explain to our incoming freshmen that in junior high, yeah, we want you to try everything and explore everything. But when you go to high school, you need to focus a little bit not just for college admissions, but for your emotional well-being. And what we stress to kids is take, take at least one class that is academically challenging for you and at least one class that just brings you joy, that makes your day, if you go to choir every day and you sing your troubles away and that type of thing. But a, we see a, more and more kids coming out of junior high thinking they can do it all. And, and I've had parents say, oh, well, she can be in choir and she can be in athletics and um, she can take an AP class as a freshman, you know, three AP classes as a freshman. I said, please don't, you can't. Well, we won't allow that. So um, helping parents and students understand what is reasonable for and healthy for that child isn't what matches what's reasonable and healthy for someone else. So um, I think that's the key piece. And we're always working on doing that better. I know. Um, each of our high schools has have uh, multiple parent and student meetings and by getting that word out that make healthy choices for your student and for parents to be actively participating and not let let students just choose everything. We typically have only maybe six to 10 students who take all AP classes and that's maybe one tenth of 1%, which is about what you'd see in college. And for those particular students, it would be more stressful to not be able to take all those classes. But the average student at Pearland High School takes about three, um, three AP classes and average at um, Dawson is, is about 3.7 to four classes. So we'll keep working on that communication. I think that's key no matter what system we have or what ranking or don't know ranking or grade points. Um, I think that communication and helping uh, parents understand. Is that, how is that three, is that three AP classes a year or overall? A year, a year. Uh, I think it was 2.8 uh, the last time I ran those numbers at Pearland, and uh, 3.4, 3.5 at uh, Dawson. But, um, Corey and Lisa and I can all tell you name students who have taken three AP classes and got a scholarship to a major university. But that that focus, that well-rounded student. Uh, which is what instituted the whole purpose of the GPA waiver to begin with, I think is, is something we need to help kids understand. Instead of having that smorgasbord of, oh, I collected food for the, the food bank and I collected blankets for the Humane Society and I worked at Habitat Humanity one summer and the other summer I did a research uh, program at the local hospital. They want kids um, like that former student that Corey and I had who really have an interest in one thing and they pursue that and um, that's, that makes the kids stand out. And it also, I think, is what helps them find that sense of health um, and that they can do something that they have a serious interest in and it may translate into um, a future career choice or maybe a lifelong hobby, but um, that ability to focus is, is um, 
I think, um, a healthy choice for our kids. So we'll keep working on the communication with parents and students and to the best we can. A lot of parents and students will say, well, my friend did this or Mrs. Somebody down the, down, the, down the street said you should do that. And so I think they get accurate information from the school. Um, they'll, do, they'll make better choices. I, I also love the idea of a committee and parent participation of getting that mm -hmm. feedback directly from kind of the horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, and then um, exploring some options outside of um, a GPA waiver to sort of figure out how to find solutions to those things that come from that committee. So sure. I was speaking for that, I'm not speaking for the whole board, I'm speaking for me, but if others are sure. in alignment with that idea, I think it would be helpful. We've, we've had those committees in the past and um, we were in the process of restarting that this spring and then COVID happened and actually um, I have a couple of students already on my list, so. Okay, yeah, I'm always in for uh, public input, always in. Uh, Let's see, is, and is there, I'll open the floor to any other uh, members. Uh, is there anything else uh, that y'all want to ask the committee? Um, I will say, I, I do also want to see us look into uh, eliminating that, that whole uh, the class rank like we talked about, uh, just to see, you know, you know what, that, uh, what that would look like, right? And, and would it actually help, you know? So thank you, Mr. Palumbo, for bringing that up. Okay, uh, anything else from the board? All right, hearing nothing. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, and um, we really appreciate all the work that went into that. Thank you very much. Yep, and thanks for staying so late. You guys yeah. rock. Thank it's you. like most of y'all are at home, so <laughs> some of us in the office. Yeah, so just, <laughs> just roll, just, yeah. Yeah, good deal, good deal. Thank y'all so much. Sorry it took so long. All right, at that, we will go back and catch up our two financial items. Item five on the agenda is the, the consideration of approving a bond order to refund outstanding bonds at a lower interest rate. Yeah, and I want to say up front, I apologize uh, to our uh, Dan Martinez, and I think John Roebuck is out there somewhere that we've uh, <laughs> similarly asked you to wait until the bitter end, but. Um, I think what that also means is we want you to give us the summary version. So <laughs> you can save money. How about that? There right. you go. go. Good. There you go. go. <laughs> there you go. I'll make a motion. No. <laughs> that, is that, is that I, I in, the, in the in the packet? Let's see. So we've been that, through. I, I never feel bad making Robux stay late. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a if, I, if I can remind everyone, received uh, a presentation at the last board meeting for both this agenda item and the next. Anything changed, John? It has or not Dan? changed. R rates have stayed about the same. I do think that we will beat the expectations of the savings that I presented at the last meeting. But just because the length of time between now and when we can sell these bonds to keep them tax exempt, I don't want to change the interest rates that we're assuming right now. But I do think we'll do better savings wise. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, members. The, Everybody's yeah. okay. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I'll make a motion that the Board of Trustees approves an order authorizing the issuance of the Pearland ISD District Unlimited Tax refunding bond series 2020 number two levying the continuing direct annual ad valorem tax rate for the payment of the bonds three prescribing other matters related to the issuance of bonds including the pricing and distribution of an official statement pertaining pertaining thereto four authorizing the execution of a paying agent register agreement and escrow agreement and a purchase contract and five delegating the certain district administrative staff and officials the authority to approve all of the final final terms of the bonds second motion carbone second bear any further discussion hearing none will vote uh, trustee carbone aye murphy aye gooden votes aye floyd aye bakken Aye. Barry? Aye. Decker? Aye. Motion carries 7-0.
Got you. <laughs> well, motion carries seven zero. All right, and we will move to item six: consider resolution providing for the cash defeasance of certain currently outstanding obligations from the twenty fourteen series bonds. And again, as uh, Mrs. Carter mentioned, we did receive this at the last board meeting. And um, uh, Mr. Roebuck, I'll ask you, any changes on this item? No, sir, uh, same presentation. Again, this is okay. just a, a cash deficiency option the district can do. If uh, they keep the tax rate the same, the INS tax rate, the debt service tax rate the same. For next tax year, it will generate some funds that we can uh, use to, to pay down some bonds and generate some savings. I'll make a motion that the Board of Trustees approves a resolution um, of the Pearland Independent School District providing for the defeasance of certain currently outstanding obligations designated as Pearland Independent School District Unlimited Tax Schoolhouse Bond Series 2014, directing that the district officials effectuate the defeasance of these obligations and other matters in connection therewith. Second. Motion Carbone, second Barry. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote. Uh, Carbone, how do you vote? Aye. Murphy? Aye. Gooden votes aye. Floyd? Aye. Bakken? Aye. Barry? Aye. Decker? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you all very much for staying. Um, we, we greatly appreciate your work. Uh, that will take us down to our administrative reports. And uh, we have been through items A and B. Uh, for your consideration, trustees, is item C, D, or item C, D, and E. Uh, Dr. Kelly, did you have anything you want to highlight on any of those? Sir, sure, those are for your reading pleasure, unless you'd like to discuss. OK. Um, any discussion? No? OK. All right, Dr. Kelly, that, uh, my records, I show that we've completed the agenda. Did I miss anything? Yes, sir. No, sir. We're, we're good. Right, we're good to go. All right. Uh, trustees, staff, uh, thank you all so much. Um, we put in a full day today after the full day at work. So um, at 9.54 p.m., I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Board. Thank you. Great decisions. Thank you.